everybody. So we had a, a small problem. One of the new players was playing a wizard and tried to do like a magical thing. And it caused some conflict because the DM said that that's not how magic works. And then the player said, but everyone said I can do whatever I want in D&D. And then the GM had to try to explain that that's not how that how that works at, at all. And then the player was like, well, I don't want to play the end and got up and left the table. But there was only three players. So I, I guess session's canceled. I have, I have no commentary on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think my the thing that I like most about my weird cold opens is is just trying to anticipate your responses to them. Uh, I, I I I had the thought because of the because of the gaming question that we're about to talk about. I had the thought to myself of uh, sessions canceled because the GM is balls deep in a squealing Final Fantasy fourteen. That's where my yeah. brain went. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, I mean, the, the DMs in question, you and me, are currently... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Patch came out yesterday. Without, yeah, true. Uh, I, I'm, still in, I'm, I'm still in Shadowbringers. I know. I'm trying. Okay, I'm trying to work up the courage. I also have to start paying this up again, and I'm broke as fuck right now. Broke. You know, I hadn't thought about that, but now that you mentioned it, I'll fix that real quick. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand what's so hard about that. So many things, bud. So many things. I don't understand. Get job, forehead. I don't. I have job. Have <laughs> bills as well, <laughs> fucker. Just get better job, forehead. I don't. Wow, crazy. In this economy? No. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I don't know if that's possible. Sell your feet pics or suck some dick for money. What do you want from me? I, you know... I, I, I'm going to be honest. I don't think people want pics of my grippers. And you don't uh, know that. <laughs> I'm in Texas. Don't know I'm that. pretty sure I'm going to get my ass arrested if I try the second one. Don't uh, don't assume nobody wants to see those grippers. People like to see all sorts of weird grippers. Uh, you know, I everyone makes jokes about selling feet pics. I just feel like the market is flooded now. Like, it's, it's too late. It probably <laughs> is, but you never know. Maybe there's something. <laughs> maybe you have a unique bit, a unique texture to your grippers. I, I don't think I have a unique for. texture, but I have the weird ability to like my my toes are real flexible, so I can just grab shit real well with my feet. Oh, you could definitely make something out. Like I've definitely like grabbed like you know something and then just thrown it at someone, and they're like, "Your hands were full. Where did that come from?" And I just kind of like look down. <laughs> Listen, the best thing about the feet pick maneuver is you don't have to show your face, so nobody needs to know who it is. You just use a, a pseudonym. Or, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Use a pen name and you're good to go. Mm. I'll give it some thought. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I, good luck transitioning out of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, you fuck. I hate <laughs> you so much. Well, uh, now that that conversation is done with, uh -huh. welcome back, everybody, uh -huh. to the Sessions Canceled podcast. Where, <laughs> where we don't Josh, talk about feet pics. <laughs> where Josh just horribly derails my already scuffed as fuck intro. <sighs> yeah the talent skill yeah now it, it happens a lot i practice <laughs> i just said it the way i said that reminded me of a the the nail gun bit from Midas kids you know <laughs> <laughs> nail gun <laughs> yeah my dick split open and locust flew out you already said that it happened a lot <laughs> <laughs> necronomicon <laughs> the necronomicon <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be clear for anyone listening who has no fucking clue what we're talking about, which is probably a lot of people. It's not that funny of a video. It's really not. You don't need no, to hunt it's it down. Really not. It just is. It it's, just exists. It's really. It's the video isn't what's funny. It's the abilities. The video's ability to just like it's it's an info hazard. Once you know about it, you will begin fucking quoting it. Like, yeah, it's a brain rot. Just gets yeah, <laughs> like I remember I showed Josh that video <laughs> and me and Brett were doing it. And then eventually he joined in and was like, it's too late. We've got him. <laughs> Nail gun. Nail gun. <laughs> you know, the entire inception of that video is that they were home alone and had nothing better to do. I mean, than play with a fucking nail gun. <laughs> yeah, that checks out. I mean, I yeah. Isn't that what you do when you're bored at home? 
I can't say what I what I do when I'm bored at home. So <laughs> I, I know what you mean, but you perhaps shouldn't phrase it that way because people could implicate you. They they could, yeah. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. I'm not gonna elaborate though. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> I'm aware. Well, uh, not that any of you could have fucking guessed what today's episode is about. Well, you can by the title, but not by that discussion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, if, if it's coming up next on your playlist, you, I am sure you are fucking befuddled yeah, right now. Yeah, if you didn't look at the title and it, yeah, it just popped up. Hey, yeah. what's up? Yeah, hey, how's, how's it going? So, um, about a year ago, uh, my good buddy about Paladin. About a week ago. I, d- I defeated you that easily. <laughs> I'm going to fucking stab you, I swear to God. I didn't even try that hard. I defeated you so easily. There's, you ever see that episode of Indignus Ridiculous where DK makes a stupid joke and Bricky's like, I'm going to put a pipe bomb in your car. That's I, me right now. <laughs> no, but f- fair enough. It wasn't even that funny. I don't know how it just completely <laughs> fucking sidewinded me. I was gonna say, I didn't I, even try that hard. It, I, I think I'm still, like, Sunlock? stupid because of nail gun. Yeah, I think it just... Okay, I promise I'll let you. I'll let you continue. I'm gonna kill you if you don't. <laughs> I won't do anything, I promise. <laughs> I'm gonna be in New York in one week. I'll hey, fuck I, you up, buddy. I promise <laughs> I'm not gonna do anything. Okay, well, uh, about a year ago... Our good buddy Paladin sent me a rule book to a little game called Fabula Ultima. A mysterious grimoire from the back alleys, if you will. Yeah, uh, from the back alleys of Italy. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> yeah, apparently. Having yeah. taken Italian, I went, is this, is this just called Final Fable? Is this just a, a tabletop Final Fantasy well, game? And he was wait, like, wait. pause, pause, governor, pause, governor. Fabula Ultima is Latin. I, I guess. Look, Italian is the, has the most it, Latin of all the uh, romance languages, so it's basically the same thing. I don't know how true that is, but point being, it's still Latin originally. Uh, yeah, fine. But uh, yes, it means like final song or final... Uh, yeah, ultimate fable, yeah. Ultimate, ultimate story, story. Final story. It's a spoof on the word Final Fantasy. <laughs> yes. Essentially. And uh, I'll be honest, I, he, he was hyping it up. And uh, I gave it a full read, actually. I was going to, like, peek into it, and then I read it in one day. This rule book's, like, almost 400 pages. That's how that's how hooked I was. Uh, and when Although, I, it's, you know, not, it's not... I would like to point out... It, this is a little no, bit it's, of a it's tame. No, not, it's not that dense. It's, it's this, almost yeah, 400 it, pages of about 60% table. It's three... It's three uh, you know, let's get the exact number, just for posterity's sake. It's 362. 360-something. Yeah, three, okay. So 362. It is, I think it's worth pointing out just, just as a little side tangent thing, like this is why the metric of, because sometimes people will look at the page count of a role playing game to determine if it is worth their money or not. And this is why I think that's a fucking useless metric to use because this is 360 something pages. And sometimes people will do the math of like how many, how much it costs per page as you use a so if it's twenty dollars, you div, you know you divide by the three hundred and sixty five or whatever. Um, I did that, you know what I mean. Whatever, you know, yes. to get how many cents a page, whatever. I forget how. I can't. Either way, right if now. you do that, that is some goober shit. Quality, not quantity. <laughs> right. So the the whole the thing I was pointing out is like this is not a three a, it, on both sides of the spectrum. On one side, it's like it's three hundred and sixty something pages. Don't think that it's three hundred and sixty pages deep and that it's worth your money, but also don't think that it's three hundred and sixty pages dense and ergo going to be really hard to read because it's not. Is <laughs> what I was getting at there. Uh, but I also disagree with the people who do the whole dollar per hour when it comes to video games. I think that's also a useless metric. Aren't, but aren't you a proponent for shorter, better, more condensed, like shorter games with higher quality? Isn't that? Similar. 
No, that's what I'm saying. That's why I say people will will equate like people will do the math on a video game and say if the video game is sixty dollars and it's a sixty hour video game, then I am paying one dollar per hour. That's too expensive or whatever. Like that is how people will do that math. I think that is a dumb metric to use. Uh, yeah, I mean that's fair. Like, some of the best games I've ever played are very short, five bucks. Well, or really short. Right. They're 20 bucks and their transistor is twenty five dollars. It's only a four hour game. It's amazing. Right. So, no. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking about transistor specifically, uh, transistor is worth sixty dollars. It is. The experience is that good. I mean, it could be. They, I, like, they would never like, sell it at that. But yeah, no, but I would pay sixty dollars for transistor. If I Listen. could erase my memory of having beaten that game and the roller coaster promotions I went through, I would pay full price for that game. And if it'd be were, short as fuck, and I'd be like, still good. If there were a bunch of like different versions of that game, I might own them. I might own them, but there's only that in the there's only the st- the PC and the phone version, as far as I'm aware. And I'm not playing it on my fucking phone, so you know, uh, it was on consoles. Oh yeah, but that's just like the con- like you know what I mean. Yeah, there's no new, there's no like new updated version or anything like that. There's no. You know, no, there's it's no. It's not like Kingdom Hearts uh, where I own all the games three times because they're like updated versions or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Anyway. Uh, but yes, it's a it's 360 some odd pages, but it's not particularly dense. It's quite easy to read. It's also written, I would say, very casually. Um, which I think is something that actually a lot of people complain about you know reading rule books for tabletop games and i think it's really worth pointing out that some tabletop games are a lot easier to read than others and this game is a perfect example because some tabletop games are written in such a way that they just feel very encyclopedia britannica and ergo they really suck to read whereas some games are really casual and some games are like actually kind of fun to read like apocalypse world i will i will always say is actually legitimately kind of fun to read because the way vincent baker wrote it he's just he's like kind of being a dick but he's like being a dick in character because that's kind of the tone of the game so it's like fun to read because the game will be like you know you know, the game will like describe a mechanic and it'll be like big granny pulls out her fuck off shotgun and shoves it up Danny's ass roll, you know, 2d6 plus uh, plus your hard to determine the situation, you know, like shit like it's written in such a <laughs> plus fashion. Your hard. Yeah, no, I mean, well, hard is the stat. That's not even a joke. Um, I, I know. And this game, I would say, is written in a very casual like your friend is telling you about an art like about a about, you know, the, the, the final fantasy game he just played. Um, and this is where now I rag on D&D. D&D is written like Encyclopedia Britannica and is often very hard to get through. Yeah, that's fair. In- inversely, actually, so <clears throat> I genuinely think Fabula should be studied as a masterstroke for localization. Oh, I mean, I don't know enough. Because the game was originally written say. in Italian. Right, right. But like the 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 wording for it is so casual and it's it's got like a fun sort of lighthearted jaunty like use of diction that you're like, you know, it, it kind of just makes you smile like a perfect example. Uh, the second paragraph on page 31 when it talks about the game rules, it says. Throughout this chapter, the game's mechanics are presented in a way that feel the most intuitive. However, sometimes you'll have to jump between pages in order to get the full picture on how things work. It won't happen too often, I promise. You're like, ah, oh, okay, cool, thanks. <laughs> I mean, sure. I, I don't I don't know enough. I'm not language hard, me talk no spell good. I don't know enough about that kind of shit to make any kind of comment on that, but it, it is localized well enough that it's an easy read. I could say that much. So sure. Yeah. <laughs> that being said, also going from Italian to English is a lot easier than going from like Japanese to English or Russian to English. You know, true. Very true. A little bit of that. Anyway. Actually, speaking of heaven forbid, there's a there's a Japanese version of D&D now. Oh, my Lord. I would not want that I, job. I've heard I 
I wish them, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I wish them well, but I would not want the job of translating that game into Japanese. Yeah, that must be an ordeal. <laughs> I don't know I, how else to put it. I would assume. Anyway, you read it in a day. <laughs> I, yeah, I read it in a day. Oh, actually, it was that you, fucking good. Pause. You know something else you could do in a single day, Isaiah? Follow us on social media. Like, share, subscribe. I tell... Not a, sure. Yes, I was going to say you could hit the follow or subscribe button. But yes, fine. I mean, okay. it is a thing. You can... Yes, I know, but tap, I, tap, tap. I never mind. We'll I know. Discuss I later. just I, discuss look, later. I discuss understand. Discuss I later. just Get forget. Anyway, yeah. So I read the book in a day. It was really cool. And it was it was so good that, you know, like me and Josh kind of casually look at rule books from time to time. We're like, oh, that's got some cool mechanics. This is good. It, it like almost made me want to straight to straight up drop hellscapes and start a new game, which is very rare for me. Like, I mean, I would say it's less it was, rare for me, but yeah, it's very rare for me. There, two games did that. It was it was this game and Lancer and I'm running Lancer now. So <laughs> I should sort of tell you how captivated I was. I have that and, problem and for with a almost- lot of reasons with almost every game I read that's not just complete garbage and because of that uh, I sometimes will actively avoid trying to read a new game because I'll just want to burn my game to the ground my current game whatever current thing I'm in yeah he's mentioned yeah he said it a lot <laughs> during D&D he's like I just want to play this other game now it's like, yes this but, is why I have but to read the home stretch yes this is why I have to try and avoid reading new games too often yeah You know, it, it'd be that way. I, I I just I was just letting the I was letting the awkward sit for a second. <laughs> uh, I mean, starting just at some pretty general, uh, like thoughts. What did you think of it? You read dead the whole thing in like two days, basically two days. Um, what I think of the game in general? Yeah. Um, it's going for a very, very specific. This game was made for a target audience. Big time. Uh, And uh, I am the target audience, so it hits pretty well for me. (laughs) Yeah. But to be clear, when I say a target audience, right, this game is for the big fucking weebs who, you know, learned about D&D because of games like Final Fantasy as opposed to the other way around. Um, and, you know, I am that weeb who play, who's played Final Fantasy, played most of the Final Fantasy games. I played the Persona games. I played the Dragon Quest games. You know, I've played... Wow. <laughs> Everything just zooped out of my brain. Dragon's Dogma just popped into my head, which is a weird one. That just, but you know, that's the thing. I've played a lot of JRPGs. Is the thing I'm trying to get off. Try, point mm-hmm. I'm trying to make there. Um, I like how I couldn't remember any. I, I like. I said those three, and then the rest were like, nope, we don't exist. <laughs> just, I've played just other really ones. Fought at the end of that. Yeah, one. <laughs> Xenoblade. I've played some of Xenoblade. I mean, I guess you could sort of count Pokemon, although most people don't. But do with that what you will. Anyway. I mean. They're wrong. It's a JRPG. It, like, it has all the meat and potatoes of a JRPG. It is, but I, I don't. I feel dirty calling it a JRPG myself. So, <laughs> why? Because it's just, I just, it, it, that's too long of a too long, complicated of an answer. But I don't like Pokemon, so you know, that's fine. I, okay, fair enough. I mean, I don't either. I don't like the games. Really, is what I should say. Um, anyway, yeah. so yes, I am very much the target audience. I am that fucking weeb. Um. So for me, it hits in terms of the tone it is trying to do. I think if you're somebody who plays D&D and likes. Like if your vibe is that you like, you know, the high fantasy adventure game. But you don't necessarily like a like JRPGs. I don't know if this game's going to hit so much for you. Uh, 
I think it'll be like if you have a friend in your group who's a big D&D guy and you're a big like Final Fantasy nerd and you try to get your friend to play Fabula, he might come in and try to play it and be a little like a little iffy on the tone, you know, like I don't know if he's going to be 100 percent down. Uh, So keep that in mind. I feel I, guess. I don't know. I, I feel like you they would be down because it's it's. You know, it, it is built to be generic enough, and I think it does actually succeed in being kind of setting agnostic. Uh, um, yes, but the mechanics of the game, I think, do a lot to invoke the style of game it's trying to be, which is that that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, by the way. Uh, but like, yeah, I think there's a lot of mechanics in that game that really invoke that JRPG feel. So, yeah, well, so that's kind of what I'm saying is I, I think people would would enjoy it. They might not be able to appreciate it as much. But I think pretty much damn near anyone could read this and be like, this game, it sounds really cool. I mean, if you look at it from a pure limit, like if you look at it bone dry mechanic standpoint, then, yeah, there's you could probably sort of look past the tonal stuff that you're not into and maybe make it work. That's possible. Um, I don't know. The entire time I was reading the book, I imagined everything in the art style of like a dragon quest or a final fantasy tactics. So <laughs> for me, no, there's I no, too. I, there's no moving past the tone at all. Like it all looks like that in my head. <laughs> it, it does for me too, but you and I are sort of, uh, you know, we were coming in with a preconceived notion of like these games and what they feel like, but I, yeah, I don't honestly, sure. I, I genuinely think just based on the way that the mechanics of this game are built, it actually does fit the you can kind of do whatever thing that people always talk about because it it's, does it's to a point. in a lot I of mean, ways way more rules light than 5e. I would and say it's really sort of built around the narrative. I would say it it fits the you can do whatever you want within the bounds of heroic fantasy heroes. Like, of course, you can't yeah. really break out of that cage, but that cage is rather large and gives you a lot of options. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, it's going to be really like you have you'd be hard pressed, I think, to play this game. Like, you can't play this game and invoke like. You know, it. it's not going to feel like first edition D&D grungy dungeon fucking, you know, I'm just dude McGuy fighter from town bimbly fuck. Like, it's you, you're going to have a really hard time trying to do that. Or like if you want to. I mean, you might even have a little bit of a hard time invoking something kind of like Dragon's Dogma to a certain degree. Um, but within that bounds of like over the top, fairly colorful, fairly high fantasy. Yeah, like you could do a lot within that that wide net. I'd say. Mm -hmm. I mean, particularly like the Fabula points, which is like a core mechanic, obviously. Uh, is invoking a very kind of heroic stick it to the man overcoming the odds thing you know yeah yeah uh anyway long story short uh yeah i mean yes i think mechanically the game does a ton of shit i like it's trying it's going for a specific tone and it's hitting that tone very well it's invoking a specific like subgenre. i think it's hitting that quite well I, w I wanted to play it after I finished reading it. I had ideas for a character. I had ideas for a campaign. It's hitting all the notes. I read the GM stuff. I looked at the monsters. I liked how the monster stat blocks worked. I liked the GM advice stuff. So like, yeah, it's like. It's like almost a five out of five for me, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, a hard agree. It is. Pretty much everything Josh said, it it just checks all the boxes in a lot of ways. Uh, I have a couple of nitpicks with a couple of very specific. Uh, point like a couple of very specific things within the mechanics, but they're really nitpicky. They're like. They're like minutia type stuff that you have to that you would only pick on if you pick up on if you're reading carefully or you've played it for a little bit, you know? Yeah, so. There's no, yeah, I mean, I, there's nothing glare. There's no mechanic that I read that glaringly stood out to me as like, ooh, I really dislike that. Like, there's nothing like that. No, yeah, I, I agree. And and yes, there there are some things where I'm like, eh, I don't 100 percent know how I feel about that. But yeah, for the most part, it's it's 
Can't give it a perfect score, but it's it's pretty damn close. It's like it's like a 95. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is like a nine and a half out of ten. It's it's wild how good this is. Uh, again, without further though, ado, I think we again, should just though, get into with, it. With, with the caveat of we are the target audience. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we big are, time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, without further ado, I think we should just get into it. Uh, I mean, even at the start, at the, you know... A, they have talk about the, you know, the the pillars of gameplay, the stuff you'll need, what's asked of the players, what's asked of the DM, the introduction stuff. That's pretty much universal across most RPGs. I like that a lot of that stuff is codified. It doesn't necessarily need to be. Well, but I would it say is. The, the eight pillars actually are not generic. I think the eight pillars are are uh, very specific to the game. And the eight pillars is like these specific things you should always have in mind no matter what. And like they will... If you keep these in mind, the game will feel correct, you know? Yeah, and you know, that's fair enough. So I, I guess we'll, we can we can sort of list those out. Uh, the eight pillars of the game sort of uh, encapsulate how the fantasy, how the setting the kind for of your particular fabulous. Exactly, yeah. And how your fabula game should feel. So they are as follows. Uh, ancient ruins and harsh lands as one. A world in peril. Clashing communities. Everything has a soul, magic and technology, heroes of many sizes and shapes. It's all about the heroes and mystery, discovery and growth. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to read the, the full paragraphs in each because no. that'd be a lot of, of but most of yeah, the pretty self-explanatory. Pretty self-explanatory yeah, uh, these eight things sort of act as the framework by which you build the world off of. I will say and, um, the one uh, it's all about the heroes is an example of one of the things I was saying where tonally, right? The game's always going to be that heroic fantasy where it's about the heroes, right? You're not going to play a game where the heroes are just where the main characters are just some guys, right? That doesn't really. Yeah, you, you really cannot run Dirt Farmer Simulator in no. Fabula like cyberpunk. Like, don't even try <laughs> cyberpunk as a genre, right? Tends to be you're just some guy fighting the man. This game is very much not that it's like, no, no, you are the hero. You are a notable person or at very least you're going to get to a notable point if you don't start there. Yes. Although the game by default basically does start you as notable hero guy. Yeah, I mean, you start as a level five adventure, which is, you know, nothing to sneeze at. We'll get into the leveling system in a second. But uh, yeah, you, you are the game just assumes that you are already kind of badass. And uh, it's really only uphill from there. Something I did want to bring up that I like a lot is that, as I stated before, Fabula can be pretty setting agnostic. And the game I mean, it, specifically it literally has no setting. <laughs> it literally has no setting. But uh, oh. what I mean is like thematically genre wise, it can sort of fill most niches. Not necessarily like the minutia of it, but perfect example the game lists specifically three separate settings, quote unquote, that the game could exist in. Uh, the first of which is high fantasy, which is, I think, what most people would be running it as something, you know, akin to Final Fantasy one through four. You'd have, you know, it's sword and board magic and wizardry. Pretty bog standard, I think, for a lot of like what people think of like D&D fantasy. Not necessarily how it plays out, but how it feels or, or how people like to run it. Uh, after that, you get like natural fantasy, which is stuff like uh, Nausicaa in the Valley of the Winds, Spirited Away. Very Studio Ghibli. <laughs> Ghibli shit. You know, the idea that that like, you know, you're the, the stories are about tribal peoples with spirits in the air, uh, a sort of mystical greater force of will in nature. Very fun. The one that I think spoke to me specifically for obvious <laughs> reasons was techno fantasy, which is more akin to things like Final Fantasy 14. Uh, to, now that I'm thinking about it, my brain just went completely fucking blank. Uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wilds. Uh, what are some other good ones, Josh? It'll be out of you. For like the techno fantasy? I mean, Z Xenoblade and Xenogears. Yes, those are solid. Um put me on the spot a little bit to my brain uh, a lot of elements of the final fantasy games have the techno fantasy like 14 has a lot of techno fantasy shit within it uh you yes. know all the magitech and whatnot 
that's obviously a core part of the six sixes storyline. Um, oh, perfect. Uh, Guilty Gear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Guilty Gear is very techno fantasy. Yes. Sort of, kind of. Yes. Soul's bike is created with spells, but it's still a bike, but it's right, right, right. Not. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and these are the three main genres that the game recommends that you play in, but they have enough in here, uh, like we'll get into it in a bit with villains, that I think you could very easily do like a horror-tinged heroic fantasy that I think would be really cool. I had some thoughts about that. I think that would be trickier. Trickier for sure. I, look, I, I'm not saying it'd be easy, but I think it'd be 100% doable. Um... So my first point, uh, past the introduction, I really like that the game references that the rules are a framework that are made to be tweaked and altered to fit niche situations. You know, like it, it specifically says if things are sort of wor- are, are not working in a in a like moment where a rule call is required, it's fine to shift things around a bit to tweak things. You don't have to be so hard and fast to the rules that they become. Uh, sort of suffocating i mean i think most games they do nowadays but i like i don't know it puts it in big bold letters right at the front of the book it doesn't like try to go oh well you know you could it's like it just kind of tells rules are made to be bent it is what it is it does warn you though very explicitly that you know the rules are naturally interlinked and changing shit randomly could absolutely negatively affect the game. So be uh, understand where you're going to change things, have conversations with the players or the dungeon master about where and what is being changed. And just know that there might be some wonkiness, but to sort of play it on the fly and, and let it rock. Uh, something that I really liked that they grabbed from, I believe blades uh, was the like group sheet, the party sheet. Oh, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I don't know. To, to you, that might be a minor thing, but to, I really like the idea of a party sheet. It really helps keep things, in my opinion, like congruent I for the like game. I like a party sheet. I don't think this game really did anything with the idea. You don't think so? Nah, it's mostly just a fancy note sheet. I mean, yes, it is a fancy note sheet, but I like, like yes, the thing I, about, I see what you're saying. The thing about in Blades, the, you have like your your, your gang your and gang like your sheet territory and all that shit. Yeah. Like yes. it is his own character sheet. It's an entire mechanic, you know, like it, it, it influences the game and the style of game that you're playing within blades quite a lot. This game, it doesn't, they didn't really utilize it very much. It, it does a little bit because you're supposed to kind of build the world together. So the group sheet is somewhat useful for that, but it is still mostly a note taking sheet. Uh, yes, it, I think I don't know. It does inform like it does specifically say write out what sort of party you're going to be, what sort of adventure you want to go on in the yeah, same but, way that in Blades, right? You write that if you, you write if you're assassins or thieves or bravos or whatever. Right. The difference being be assassins versus bravos get different abilities and different equipment and different missions. Whereas in True. this case, it's mostly just a fictional thing of like we're mercenaries or we're the King's Guard or we're like assassins or like, you know, it. it it's not influencing your character mechanically in any way. It's just sort of how your vibe is. So, yes, correct. You know, I'm not against it. Nec- I'm not like against it. It's just. I don't know. This is the kind of thing that I'd be doing on my own as a GM anyway. I don't really need the game to be like, here's the group sheet. It's like I was probably already taking these notes and compiling this information. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, you would be, but you also have, you know, the experience of things like Blades and Powered by the Apocalypse, like. I mean, I guess, I don't know, I think people do that for D&D too, though. Maybe not as much as they should, but do it. No, yeah, I mean, I don't think people, I think they should do it more, I don't think they do it enough, and I, I, I think it's because a lot of people don't really know how to organize those notes, or they, I mean, not that they don't, but they might not know how to organize those notes. I definitely didn't. Um... You know, when I was running Hellscapes, well, having a party sheet probably would have been solid for me to, you know, constantly remind myself that the players are, in fact, couriers and should be doing delivery missions and not. I'm going to tell you a secret, Isaiah. You organize those notes however the fuck you want. Doesn't matter. Uh, yes, you do. But <laughs> having a template, having something to work off of, I, I find incredibly helpful. 
I guess. Uh, past that, you get, I mean, in big bold letters, scenes. And this is not new. Uh, again, I just like that they point this out, that the game uh, specifically uses scenes, the, the, the concept of scenes to denote the passage of time. Uh, there is no real, like, the game goes on for an hour, or the battle takes place over the course of a minute. It's there's just no, there's no minute tracking of time. It doesn't. There's no spells or abilities where it says this lasts one hour or ten minutes or any of that bullshit that D and D does that drives me insane. It's this ability lasts for the scene. This ability lasts until you rest. This ability lasts, you know, until you do X, Y, or Z thing. Like, yeah, it's it's abstracted out with the time, and. Quite frankly, I think that's just the better way to do it across the board, and I've heard no strong argument against that. I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> no, I agree. Uh, it, it does it does it, and it does it well until the like very few instances where it fucking doesn't anymore. It just it just goes real. My, there's a hold on in the techno fantasy. There's a magic item that uh, specifically says you can hit light speed for one second. And there are, there are other things dotted around the rule books that have similar shit going on. That I one mean, just has me in fucking tears. <laughs> sure. Although I will say hitting light speed for one second. I think the point is that you do it for an instant, right? Like, yes, yes. I momentary. But they, they did specifically denote one second and it yeah. had me chuckling because I was like so much for fucking scenes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they probably just should have said for an instant. Yeah. Or a moment. But yeah, I mean, whatever. Yeah, not a huge issue. Again, very funny. <laughs> uh, the scenes are really cool because they are uh, listed out and are described with uh, like pretty bespoke classifications, right? You have conflict scenes, which denote anything from combat to chases to tense arguments. This any, is one of any the time places that I have beef with the game. Oh, really? Why? Well, let me finish the point and let me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anytime that it's and it's described like this in the book, anytime the narrative comes to a crescendo is time for a conflict scene. However, that does not mean that every combat is a conflict and they make that very clear. And I find that interesting and something that I kind of want to give a shot to. Uh, after that, you have interlude scenes, which are the slow moments, right? They are. You know, characters traveling the planes. I mean, slow sort of in terms of the action, right? It's characters delving a dungeon, looking for clues, montages, travel uh, stuff. Any of those moments where things are sort of pulled back and you just kind of watch as the, the narrative goes on without really interacting with it on a personal level as a player or the GM. Those are interlude scenes. Uh, then you have game master scenes, which are straight up the like pan to another scene while Darth Vader and the Emperor do their evil villain monologues and the players if, aren't there. They are not interacting. If it's anyone just has, the, if anyone has played Final Fantasy 14, it is straight up meanwhile in the Empire. It's literally yes, those. It's scenes. literally those. It's very funny that they and they tell you to do this very explicitly like the characters see a scene that they are not present for and and don't actually know. In Basically, it's, it's a dramatic irony thing, right? You're showing a scene to the players, not the characters. Yes. Uh, you, you know, uh, video games and shit do this video games, but this kind of thing happens all the time where you like read something the villain is doing, even though the characters that would not have them. Yes. Um, they do also spe like they don't list it out, but they do specify standard scenes, which are what's happening, happening in the here and now the conversations players are having them talking with a shopkeep bartering for gear. Those are standard scenes. They're not necessarily listed out along with the other specialized specialized ones, but they also exist in our, our reference directly. After that, we have the sessions and campaigns, which I mean, it's, this is pretty bog standard. Typical session lasts beef. about four hours. Huh? Want to hear my beef? Oh, that's right. Your beef. Shit. My bad. <laughs> you didn't jump in. I, I thought I thought you were going to. And then you did. I, I, well, I wasn't sure where you were going to stop there. Um, it's kind of, I don't know, it's sort of a not a huge de be deal, I suppose. But so like the conflicts, when it talks about conflicts, because con like a conflict is a is a pretty bespoke mechanical thing. Um, and it says a conflict could be a battle, a chase scene, a tense audience with a king. 
right? So it's like the idea is that a conflict doesn't necessarily have to be a fight. It could be any sort of tense situation, which is fine. Um, but we have a little bit of the D&D problem here, I feel, where the game is like everything doesn't have to be a fight. And then the characters themselves are kind of a box of knives with a lot of killing things and fighting things abilities and not a lot of abilities or things that are specifically, at, at least as far as I saw, that specifically are tailored to like a diplomatic argument, right? Like the idea, like for the chase scene, the chase, you know, a chase scene or like, you know, a, a, a daring jump from building to building or like, a, you know, a, a, a ship battle, like that stuff I think will all work fine in the game. But when it talks about conflicts in a social scene scenario, I think the game is maybe going to have a little bit of a struggle there because I don't see anything mechanically to really reinforce that. So it seems like social scenes are just going to kind of be on you as the player. And it says that a tense social scene could be a conflict. And then the game specifically says that when you're initiating a conflict, you should roll initiative. Which... Maybe a little bit weird if you're like having a tense negotiation with the king and then it's like, all right, guys, roll initiative because this is a conflict. You know, that's maybe a little wonky. So I will agree with you there. I do have to challenge you, though. The game does actually have conversational combat abilities. I didn't see anything, but uh, the lore master and the orator specifically have things that are like the here. Let me read the orators uh, condemn. You may use an action and spend five my point mind points to perform an opposed uh, check against a creature that can hear and understand you describe your accusations. If you succeed, the target loses a, Oh God, what does SL mean again? Skill level, uh, skill level. Yeah. Times 10 mind points and suffers the dazed or shaken uh, condition. You also have things yeah. like encourage uh, th there. Those two classes, more than anything else, are designed around the social combat a little. But you bit. do have stuff with but like, um, here's here's the thing, right? OK, so that orator ability of accuse it's or condemn. It's like you spend, you know, some point you spend some of your mind points to do the thing. You make a check, blah, blah, blah. And then they suffer a condition. They're losing mind points and suffering a condition that doesn't matter if you're not in a fight, right? Like like running out of mana in a conversation is not relevant. It's not like when you lose your, your mind points, you like go unconscious or anything like that, you know? So it doesn't really matter. You know, like they're sort of kind of doing it, but not really. There's no, there's no conversational combat mechanic. So stuff like that is like kind of works, but only kind of. Well, sort of. So they do talk about how enemies, you know, use their mind points as well as a as a resource. Right. So I believe the idea being is that if you're getting into a verbal disagreement, some sort of social dispute with a person. Your mind points sort of take the, the, the place of your hit points. So you're spending them and taking them from others. I mean, you could run it the that idea way, being but is that if you. Well, it's, it's, think, it's just sort of based on the context clues. I don't see the game saying that straight up anywhere. I don't remember it saying that. anywhere. No, I don't. I don't. I, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't state it anywhere either, but that seems to be the implication and it, it seems more. Right, but I can't, I can't assume mechanics based on like generous interpretate, you know, like you gotta tell me. No, I mean, I, I, it, I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I to me, clear. that seems like a safe assumption. I mean, yeah, you could do. I'm not saying it's not an assumption you could make, but if I'm looking at the game critically, I'm not going to make that assumption. I can't really do that. You know, I have to I have to work with what you told me. I just would have liked if you're if you're going to tell me conflicts don't have to be fights all the time and a conflict can involve social stuff, then give me some social mechanics. And we're very light on that. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't know. I, I think we have like n maybe not enough, but I don't think we're like super scarce sparse. Sorry, there's two whole classes that are designed around it. 
Wayfarer has some stuff that involves it. They have an ability uh, or two. I would not say the entire class is designed around it. No, I mean, the, the orator's entire class is built around that. But it still, but it still feels like they're meant to use these abilities in a fight. Like, they are using their verbal panache, but they're still doing things so like encourage during a conflict, spend mind points to choose another creature. You can hear and understand you. They recover skill level times five hit points and choose one of their stats. They treat it as a size bigger, right? Like there's still there's still combat stuff. You know what I mean? Yes, they are. But I, the game, I, I think I don't know. I don't know. Like we, these, we might just we might just stay disagreeing on this one because I, I feel like these. Can help create a very interesting you know, something that needs work, absolutely. Like, does it? Could it be extrapolated on more? But I think if you wanted the bones of a social dispute, I think you could do plenty with with this and Loremaster. But um, that's that's not what I want. What I want is if you're going to tell me social conflict is a thing, then give me some side of some nature of a social conflict mechanic. Like, if the game had, you know, I don't know stress points or something and it's like if a character maxes out their stress points they like tap out of the conversation like something because and you're really you wouldn't need much because most of the game is already pretty open-ended so it's like i don't i don't expect a lot i don't expect burning wheel level of craziness but if you just had a thing where it's like oh if you could tap out a person's stress points they like give up on an argument or something like that like just a little something about that sort of vibe just to to re like to actually support the statement because as the statement is, it feels it's there a little bit, but not very strongly. Well, so that's what I'm saying. I'm pretty that that's it's that's what it feels like they're doing, because if you run out of mind points as an enemy, you can't really use any abilities. You can't so use abilities, your, but that has nothing. That's not saying you're like unconscious or anything. No, but if if in the social situation, based on what we have for orator, your abilities are tied to your mind points. The idea basically being is you're out of ammo. You've got nothing left to use. Your your argument is dead in the water. But enemies don't have. Enemies don't like there's not like a stat block for the king's like the king's advisor. And he has a bunch of abilities that do a, a, a similar thing in return. You know what I mean? Like there's nothing there's nothing for that on the enemy side. So you're you can do it a little. You can have some of that stuff as the orator, but then the enemy cannot really do anything in return anyway. Like obviously, as a gym, you can make your own stat block, but of the stat blocks we are given, that doesn't exist. So it's 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 a one sided fight thing argument. One, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I I don't know. I. I I don't know if we, yeah, I don't think we're going to agree. I, I think you have the tools at hand. I think you're extrapolating based on what the game gave you, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not one to one what the game gave you. No, it's not. It's 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 definitely not one to one with the game. Gave you. But yes, and I am absolutely extrapolating with. But with that, though, I feel like you are given the tools. I. <laughs> The next big thing they talk about, which again is, I'm pretty sure, sh just a straight up wholesale borrow uh, from Powered by the Apocalypse or the Bonds. A it's sort of, sort of, kind of, kind of. Oh wait, yeah, sorry, but I, I messed up. The sessions and campaigns. This is pretty standard. Uh, the game states that the uh, session can be anywhere from three to four hours long. You're a game, a specific campaign, and I, I, I know Josh probably pissed that they use the phrase campaign. Uh, but I don't get. Weren't you someone who's like, you hate when stories are called campaigns because it's not what a campaign no. is? Well, it's not me. Was that not you? I thought we had this conversation a while ago. No, you I were talking about somebody else very specific talking about, but it wasn't me. What's their screen name? I don't know, but it wasn't me. God damn it. All right, well. <laughs> Fabulous says that campaigns are typically supposed to be about 20 to 50 sessions long, which we did the math. You likely are not meant to reach max level in the game. You can. It's a possibility. But given a 20 session campaign, you are absolutely not reaching max level. And I think that's fine. I don't know. That feels a little. That feels a little weird to me. 
I mean, you know, like in a adventure module, you're not reaching level 20 in D&D. Yes, but I, I just it just seems strange to me that you would build your you build your level curve and, and set up your game and then not not 100 percent intend for somebody to finish it to max level like I would. You would think the base game you would want to try and push people to go all the way to max level. Just feels it feels a little strange that they're kind of saying like, yeah, you, you are not expected to go to max. I, like an I adventure module where understand. you don't is one thing, but a, a full game where you don't encourage it. I don't know. Seems mm-hmm. odd. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from on that. You still can, uh, obviously. Nothing stops. You can, yeah. But they're not they're not actively encouraging it. Yeah. Uh, before we actually before we jump to the bonds, the, they do reference some important rules. They denote what an ally is. Um when dividing uh, numbers for the sake of healing or hurting or checks, always round down. I actually thought I thought it was pretty funny that they give you a an actual order of operations to things when it comes to doing any sort of math to the game. Being you do additions first, then go to subtractions, then multiplications, then divisions. Well, Five E has that now for instances and stuff. Do they? Yeah, it's a paragraph that tells you what order. Now I look. I was pretty good at math. This is definitely not PEMDAS. I, <laughs> I'm just wondering, like, I know why they no. did it that way. They want it to invoke a certain field, but I thought it was weird that the multiplication didn't come first. Um, I assume because it's easier to prioritize add subtract just from a mechanical keeping standpoint. Yes. Yeah, well, the numbers also like if you multiply or divide first, the numbers will get really fucking wacky and throw everything that's, out of whack. You know, <clears throat> that's what I mean. It, it's easier to do the adding in. Oh. Then yes, numbers don't don't get asked. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they talk about uh, timing issues when like effects will take will go into to effect if essentially if you control it as a player if you control what if multiple effects are going off at the same time uh, you get to choose what order they apply in if they are controlled by separate players they have to agree if they can't uh, the GM randomly decides and if they are controlled by the player and other non-player characters. Players always go first. Uh, they do a little bit of uh, anatomy of a character. Uh, you know, what makes a character a character? Their identity, which is a small blurb or short sentence that describes them. Their theme, which is, you know, anger, justice, ambition, something that, that notes actually, them as a person. These actually matter mechanically, too. They do, yes. I'm going to get into them more later, but this, they're just sort of briefly bringing it up at the front. Uh, and then their origin, which is their homeland. That's the thing that matters the least because it's completely like derivative no, of a can, campaign. Like, no, you can invoke your origin. You can, but it's not something you can look up in the game, right? Like mm-hmm. identity and theme, like because there's no map to this game. There's no preset setting. So this is something. Oh, that, yeah. Like, but the identity not, and themes not, that they list are just suggestions anyway. You don't have to take them. Y- yes. Yes. I just. So it's yeah, kind of I chose the wrong words. Them. Not that they're the least important, but they're the one that's most dependent on a campaign. The origin is specifically. I mean, I now guess. we get to bonds. Uh, for those of you who might not know what bonds are, bonds are a narrative driven mechanic that allows players to. So these these don't work like Dungeon World bonds, if that's what you're going down. No, but I'm, I'm going to talk about the way they are in this game. They, they have these in other games, but I'm just sort of explaining how it is here. Uh, yeah, they're... Yeah, yeah. They're a, a narrative mechanic that allows players to essentially proc them for bonuses to roles, uh, boons in a narrative sense, and they are reliant upon players and characters getting to know and forming like literal uh, uh, bonds with other people. Yeah. Uh, you have a total of six available bonds. They are uh, in sets of three, uh, two sets of th- three sets of two and exist on opposite sides of a spectrum. You have admiration and infer- or inferiority. You have loyalty or mistrust and affection or hatred. And you can use these to des- uh, to describe how your character use other characters and vice versa. The more of them that you have and you can form them over downtime, the more the the higher the number you can add to rolls when you invoke it. 
and but obviously you, can also you can't invoke it. You can form them with like NPCs and shit. Yes, you can. I think yeah. you can actually form them with like stuff also. Can you form them with things? I, th- I think yes, like, you like can. Concepts. Yeah, they talk about places, uh, yeah. objects. Yeah, you can. Which um, I think is really cool. I don't. I don't love how they represent this. I get what they're the doing. Plus one, plus two, plus three, or the admiration, loyalty, affection. Uh, I don't like the words and them being split into pairs. I because I just think it caught it, like when I was reading it, it caused needless confusion. I don't see any point in having them be words when it could just be a sliding scale of plus three to minus three, and it could just be plus three positive emotions towards something, not minus three is negative emotions towards something. Or you could do what they do in Apocalypse World, which is history. And the higher history you have with someone, the better you know them, and the less history, the less you know them. But that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be positive or negative. You can have plus four history with somebody that you fucking hate because you've tried to kill them five times. And the reason you know them really well is because you tried to kill them five times. It's not because you're friends. So I would much prefer something like that. Turning it into words and then like, I don't really understand what the point of the pair pairing them off is. The pairs don't really do anything because at the end of the day, it only matters if you have the plus, like if you have a plus one, a plus two or a plus three, the which side of the pair you have doesn't actually do anything on its own. Like you could have admiration or inferiority mechanically. It's a plus one. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? So splitting uh, yes. them into this two sides thing just felt just slightly confusing for no real benefit. They do actually provide a reason um, a little bit later on in the bonds section. The The idea basically is to, to, it's for characters to understand that that the bonds that they form narratively can be complex. So you could form an admiration for someone, but hate them. Or you can be you can feel mistrust towards someone, but feel affection towards them. I believe that the words are chosen very specifically. Yeah, I just I don't know. I don't I don't feel like I need. From, uh, from the standpoint of it is as a mechanic, I don't feel like I need the words to do that for me. I could just think about it that way on my on my own. You know, like I can just I can just look at my sheet and see I have a plus two bond with a specific character and then just think about what does that plus two represent for me in relation to that character and just decide. I don't, I don't really need the words to tell me. You know what I mean? It just feels it's about codifying, Josh. You got to codify them. But this, it feels, but you want to codify when the point of the codifying it is to have a benefit to it. I don't feel like splitting it into the two pairs really benefited any. You know, like the mechanic of building bonds with other characters or NPCs and stuff that has a benefit. The splitting it off into these two word pairs. I don't feel like really does anything. And again, it just caused me confusion when I was initially reading it. Like I had to read it a couple of times to actually make sense of it. So yeah, Yeah, I can see where you're coming from. It doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, all I'm going to do in my brain is just boil them down to the numbers anyway, because I don't like the words. So (laughs) it doesn't matter necessarily. I mean, if that helps you sort of quantify the, the mechanic better, I think it's pretty fair. I mean, helps understand the mechanic. Yeah, that's what I meant. After the bonds, you have the fabula points, which are kind of low key, the most important mechanic in the game. <laughs> um, yeah, almost, pretty much. They do so much and show up so often. They are they are effectively the main currency of the game that is not hit points, mind points, or zenit, which is the they're, money. They're or your zenit, main like, zenit. I think it's zenit. It's zenit. Yeah, zenit. Um, I'm, I'm not pronouncing it as much as I probably could. I just. <laughs> oh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, yeah, the 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 fabula points are your primary like uh, power currency, like player power currency. Um, 
as well as being one of your primary ways to progress your character. Not the only way, but one of the one of the big ones. So. It's also funny yeah, that you... I, I, I found or... it odd that the game lets you hoard them to an infinite amount. I thought that was an odd choice. I thought so, too. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, I. I feel I like... wonder if. I feel like capping I... it just encourages using it more. It does, but they, they seem to be aware of that because they say, you know, you might be the player who spends them as soon as you get them, or you might be someone who saves them for a special occasion. Um, yes, and it and they w- they went with they essentially went with the carrot. They went with the carrot method over the stick method, because rather than capping it, they say you get XP for spending the points. So you're going to want to spend them, which is fine. But like. I don't know. I also feel like maybe there should have been cap, but I guess the cap doesn't necessarily matter. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I they say that you can be a player who hoards them, but you kind of can't. Well, I don't know why you so would. much stuff. No, no, I mean, I don't either. But even if you wanted to, even if you wanted to be the guy, you kind of can't You use them to invoke your bonds, which is how you, you know, the purpose for that, obviously, is that so you're not invoking bonds every two seconds. You you use it when it matters or when it's relevant. Uh, you use it to, to declare ne- narrative declarations. Uh, you use it for, you know, like you said, leveling up, re-rolling dice. It's so much of it relies on the fabula points. It procking your heroic skills. And I think some quirks, which we'll get into later. A lot. A lot. Let's just say there's a lot. You're, you're I think it's it'll be damn near impossible to actually hoard the fucking things effectively uh i mean i i guess you would hoard it by effectively just ignoring you would just ignore any of the bonus mechanics that come from it you're not going to be doing a whole lot with your character then you're just sort of a well you'll be playing within the normal bounds of the game you just won't be um won't be getting the like because the main thing you spend fabulous points is like rerolls and buffs and like narrative assistance. So you're essentially playing at like a, a power level handicap if you don't spend them. I suppose. But, so. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I my, my only argument to that is because so much of the game is narrative focused. That you are you are in less control of, of the narrative than a different than a separate player would be. Which the game was designed around being able to wrench that control away or, you know, that's worded wrong, not wrenched away, but sort of take up the control of the narrative for key moments. Um, I mean, yeah, well, you're just like I said, you're just playing your character as is. You're not taking any of the benefits that the points give you. It's not like you ha- it's not like you're required like if you don't spend the points, your like character doesn't work correctly or something like that. You're just you're missing out on some of the bonus goodies. I would go as far as to say your character just doesn't work correctly. Like I don't know. Think don't about think- all like all the different things that require that that sort of narrative resistance. Things like rituals require stuff like that a lot. Uh I don't remember rituals requiring fabula point, but either way. It's it's you're you're just playing your character a little more milk and up to the will of the GM or yeah uh, let's see what else we got past that the character level we'll talk about that later most characters will start at level five uh, the way the game works unlike D D where you know you gain a max of twenty levels and each level t- typically unless you're a ranger gives you like maybe not in volume but in terms of power like quite a bit of stuff you know your character shifts dramatically from one level to the next being able to cast higher level spell slots getting more spells stuff like that in fabula you get more levels because each level is far less important than the one that came before it or or as compared to the one that came before it and the the big thing in the game that we'll talk about next is that you're going to be multi-classing you have to be. You, you really don't have a choice unless you... I mean, it's not even really multi-classing in this game. It's just classing. <laughs> like It's just classing, yeah. You literally can't 
like even at character creation, you cannot take five levels in the same class. It says you have to have at least two different classes to start. So, yes, and that is to say you will start at level five. You can gain a level of maximum of 50 and the game expects that you level up basically every other session. Hence the 20 to 50, maybe not hitting max level discussion we had earlier. Uh, when you gain a level, you can look through the one of the myriad classes you get. You select an option. You don't have to take them uh, linearly is not the word I want to use. Uh, sequentially, it's there. They are listed in a sequential order. You do not need to take them in that order. Oh, the skills. Granted, you if you, yeah, if you do not yeah. take those skills on a level up, sometimes you just won't be able to do a thing as a character. So, like for example, the 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 first class in the game is Arcanist. All of your skills are are around using your Arcana. So, if you do not take the Bind and Summon ability. You cannot summon Arcana, and because you cannot summon them, you cannot use any of the skills Other stuff. in the class around it. So you can sort of gib yourself if you, you know, don't read. So, yes, you know, hashtag read your sheet. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I mean, most of the classes I don't think are super like that. But yeah, there's a couple instances of that. Um. <clears throat> Although it's funny because the bind and summon ability is not the first one listed. It's not. No. Feels like it probably should be. Yes, correct. It should uh, absolutely be the first one. But I think they're are they alphabetical listed? I forget. They are. Yes, they are. They're, they yeah, are they're alphabetical. alphabetical that's yeah. Because it's yeah. yeah, arcane circle, arcane regeneration, bind and summon element. Which yes. Is, yeah. Um, maybe there should be a footnote that says like take this one. <laughs> I don't yes. know. Uh, but yeah, either way, it's like, uh, yeah, like to say the game is based around multi is like. It like is and it isn't. Huh? It's almost a misnomer. Yeah, because it's like it's like multi classic is the classing like there is no normal classing. It's kind of odd. It, it was on initial read little tricky to understand how yes. the classes and like the leveling up worked. But essentially classes are just bags of skills that you pick up so it's kind of a class it's almost sort of a classless system almost but not quite yeah not quite which actually i will say i i originally thought to myself oh this game should have just been a classless system like having the class list was just kind of a waste of time because the way it ends up working is basically not a class list anyway uh, but then I thought about it a little more, and I think I kind of take that back a little bit. Uh, I think the classes being there does actually serve a purpose because I thought about something I've heard from other people online and shit is that when a game has a totally classless system, what they usually end up doing is listing all of the skills out in a big fucking listicle, right? And a lot of people look at that listicle and go... Oh no, I am scared. I do not know what to pick. I I'm I I good. No play. Right? Like they just give up because the listicle of class abilities is so long. And usually what ends up happening is a lot of those abilities are kind of supposed to synergize with each other anyway. So like you'll see a game that's a classless system and it's like kind of not a classless system. There are classes. There's just hidden in the skill list. Like somebody had the idea for a paladin character. Then they took all the paladin skills and put them in the skill list. You know what I mean? Yeah. So by having the classes and then having it where the game is like, essentially you just multi-class everyone together. What it does is, is it lets a new player look at it and go, OK, I want to play, I don't know, edgy guy with big sword. Oh, OK, Dark Knight. Oh, looks at Dark Knight. All right. So the Dark Knight has a bunch of abilities that let me be edgy guy with big sword. And then you go, OK, I would like some magical stuff. Oh, Elementalist. Yeah, yeah. That has a bunch of abilities to let me cast like elemental magics. Cool. It just packages them nicely so that you can look at a list and get an idea of what you're kind of looking for and just pick based on that as opposed to a big ridiculously long list so initial thought was bad idea I have changed my mind I think it actually makes sense mm -hmm. and so I mean uh, to do a little hyping up this is my favorite system in the game like this, this the classing is it's not the equipment 
hilariously. I'm aware. Well, the I equipment. Uh, I mean, the equipment is pretty simplistic. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, look, that did make me a little sad. I'm not gonna lie. I completely understand why it is. It kind of needs works. to be. Yeah. The game itself is. I mean, it's not rules light, but it is a simple game. There are a couple noodly bits. You know, it's, the bonds are a little noodly. The crunch. fabulas a little noodly. But on the whole, in my opinion, the game is quite simple for what it is. And I feel like that's probably by design. I mean, almost certainly by design. Yeah, I mean, it's but intended yes. to be it's intended to be relatively. Um, it's intended to it's intended to be approachable in the same way that a JRPG is approachable at the beginning. Right. Like, that's the idea. Yes. Now, JRPGs often don't stay that way, but, you know, no. No, they do not. Uh, but yes, without further ado, let me hype this shit up. So, you know, when you play games like D&D, you go, you have an idea for the character you want to make in your head, right? You go, oh, well, I want to be kind of like a spell sword. I want to be, you know, slanging fireballs and, and thwip thwipping my, my rapier or katana or whatever. And then you very quickly realize that, you know, uh, Eldritch Knight is not the vibe that you want. It's a... It's there in an outline, but the, the minutia of that thing you want really isn't involved. And that's kind of frustrating. So you kind of have to work around the limitations of the game. I'm not saying that that's not a thing in this game. Yeah, you still but have to it work is relieved. A, a degree of limitation for sure. Yes, but it is relieved exponentially by the fact that there are 15 classes, I believe, at standard. And supplements. you're allowed to mix and match wherever you want. If you want to make uh, like a smooth talking gun slinging, you know, Spike Spiegel character, you can do that. You take a couple levels of Tinkerer for the gun. You take some sharpshooter for the aim. Maybe you take a couple levels in Fury, which is like the monk equivalent for that hand to hand combat. Oh, wait. But then you take Orator for your, you know, shit talking ability. And you effectively filled out every corner of that thing that you need to make Spike Spiegel. And yes, you're still going to have to use some good old, good old, good old fashioned imagination and flavor to really zhuzh it up. But you have effectively filled every niche that you need to fill. If you want to play, uh, you know, my favorite class in Final Fantasy ever is always going to be Summoner. They tell you how to make it. You could you take three levels in Arcanist to start and then two levels in Spiritus. That way you are using the Spiritus ability to conjure creatures and pull them out of nowhere. And then you're mixing that with uh, the Arcanist ability to actually materialize creatures and summon them well, and, and fight with them. And the Arcanist ability to have like your special pet summon, like your, your main dude. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah. Your primary your funny summon. little guy. Yes. Your Bahamut. And those things together. Your Valifor. Yeah. Sir, we are, we are Efrit stands in this house. I mean, I mean, listen, you can be an Efrit stand all you want, but Yuna at the end of the day is always depicted with Valifor. So I know it's, it's kind of kind of like it is her, the first summon she gets. It's the first it's summon. It's also the first game Valifor appears. Ever. It, the first and only. Uh, no, I he's think. been in a couple other things. Has he? Yeah. Little, 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 little tidbit show ups here and there. Only, only a few, I, though. Very few. I love that little lizard chicken. <laughs> lizard bird chicken thing. Yeah, it look it it does weird spinnies with the uh, chakra varten on its back and makes meteor strikes. I, I don't know, it, it does things. I think I think Valfor is also a, a design like I think he's associated with she's associated with Yuna because design wise she has a lot of like elements from Yuna as well as being a female summon. True, I can see yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, weird bird titties. Yeah, weird bird titties and even weirder bird ar arm hook thingies the arm hooks are cool they kind of gross me out i'm not gonna lie <laughs> love them forget that she has legs i just i imagine her constantly yes. without having legs she has those well she's actually it's funny you say that because in Dissidia, when you one of your basic attacks is you some because yuna and Dissidia duo Decim is like she summons all of her different summon like all her different attacks are the summons and mm -hmm. they she summons them from the waist up so like when you summon Valifor, it's just big wings, <laughs> you know, oh, like nice. They don't summon the bottom half of it because the idea is she's like summoning them really fast. Mm -hmm. We yeah, should put Valifor on the on the thumbnail. 
this guy's. Yeah, give it some love. God knows that most of the other games don't. <laughs> I mean. Weird. Anyway, where are you? Chicken lizard. <laughs> I'm just I'm looking at it. It's weird. But yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how else I can talk this up. It, it it gives you damn near infinite potential to create the character you want to make as long as you're OK with playing, you know, reasonably within the, the you know, draw within the lines. And the lines are quite expand. Or, 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 sorry, the lines are quite minimalistic and very thick. You don't have to worry about drawing inside them that much, frankly. Yeah, and the the main thing is that you can mix and match so many because you're gonna get because you're gonna get so many levels. Oh, actually, so max level is fifty, but you can only go to level ten in any one class. Yes. So you're gonna max out the class that's like your main shtick at some point, and then you're gonna have to branch into something else. So you're gonna sort of you are forced to sort of add facets to your character no matter what. Um, and at the beginning of the game, if you really don't want to make any decisions, they give you what they call classic. They give you a list of classic characters and they basically list you out a bunch of jobs that have based have been in Final Fantasy is pretty much what they did. Um, and they have a lot you like. So they Alchemist, have, you know, Dark yeah, Knight, Alchemist, Black, Black Knight, Knight Gambler, Gambler, Gunslinger. Uh, I really pref- I'm a, I'm a big fan of Red Sorcerer. I I thought you'd be laugh at that one or, or Monster Mage. Monster Mage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um So yeah, it's like they 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 give you they essentially give you a list if you don't want to make a decision at the beginning of the game in character creation, they give you a list of classes, like class packages that they made. And then from there you could just you know, as you play the game, you're going to have some ideas, I'm sure, down the road about what you want to do. And then you pick up whatever abilities you want after that. It is very it is quite fun. Uh, and, and I like the I like the class package suggestions because it does help you really narrow down what. Um, it helps you think about like, OK, I don't have a strong idea and then it point it pushes you in a direction. Just fun. Yeah, I mean, you if you have even the slightest knowledge of Final Fantasy, you know, you'll look at. I, I don't know, I'm trying to think what's a good one. I mean, shit, you look at uh, Red Sorcerer and if you've played any Final Fantasy, you played 14, you go, oh, that's what Alice is. Oh, she's a she's a red mage. Yeah. Uh, I, yo, OK, so wait, this is how you make a red mage. Oh, sick. And then you look at it and you, you make it. But then you go, oh, wait, but I really like, you know, insert thing here i like that squall uses gun blades so you can take a couple levels in tinkerer to get a well, gun blade I, I i believe i believe gunbreaker got added to the i think it was i think it might be the techno fantasy one as gunbreaker let me check i i don't know off the top of my head let me let me double I check i think i saw quick. it somewhere on the patreon mentioning a gun blade guy um it's yeah it, actually in fact if anyone's played final fantasy 14 there's a ton of final fantasy 14 in this game in general a, a lot, yeah. There's like, a lot frankly, of that. A comical amount. A lot of that oozing. Oozing. Mm. It, ooh. Mm. What else do I want to bring? Oh, yes. If you ever, if you uh, max out a class, yeah, yeah, you are given something called a heroic skill, which is separate than like a limit break because those are in the game. They're very funny. But they are sort of a penultimate skill that is designed to sort of, defined? Fuck me. Is designed to sort of bring out the best in that particular class. So, for example, you have things like uh, Chimeric Mastery. You learn new spells from your list and you get an increased spell limit. Uh, Entropist gets Comet, which I'm pretty sure is just the Meteor spell. It's, it's just basically a limit break. Probably. Uh, Arcanist gets your uh, your Wondrous Arcana or your what's it called? Not Wondrous Arcana. Big dumb, help me out here. Uh, what's I, it called? The uh, what the the heroic skill for the Arcanist? Yeah, to get like your actual summon. Oh oh uh ba 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 arcane echo? Nope. No. Uh 
Uh, you put me on the spot. I wasn't even in that I, section. Uh, I the put myself PDF. on the spot. Don't worry. Revelation. Uh, oh, it's not. It's in the high fantasy book. It's. Uh, it, uh, ah. I mean, it, I'm a fool. Truly. Okay. Truly foolish. Lo- I am not looking at that PDF. That's fine. No, I understand. <laughs> I. Yep. <laughs> Okay. They are they are essentially epic boons or feats. They're they're designed to yeah, shift the way boons. that class is played to to give them more options, and that's very cool. I would definitely say. And a epic. lot of them, yeah, they, yeah, there are they are close to every. Oh wait, hold on, no, yeah, hold on. I'm looking at the comet one. Uh, to cast comet, you have must have mastered the entropist class. You learn the ultimate entropist seal comet. You rip open a large uh, portal to the cosmos, calling down astral debris from the gaping void. Mm, gaping. <laughs> choose an yeah. option one creature you see suffers 60 damage or you choose any number of uh, creatures you see and each of them takes 40 damage these amounts increase by 5 if you are 20 levels or higher or or by 10 if you are 40 levels or higher I'm going to keep it honest with you I most NPCs have health equal to level no. I don't think no they don't do they not? Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. Uh, your companions have their health is equal to your level. My bad. Yeah, I was going to say, I was like, that's definitely not a thing. Be- monster stat blocks. In fact, if 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 you're making it a uh, what is it? Soldier elite or a commander, the elite and commanders multiply their health by two. Yeah. Definitely not. But for this, mo- just uh, as a quick peruse through uh Hell, I don't think there are any soldier class enemies, which are the lowest, but that does not mean they are weak. I don't think any of them have more than 60 HP. <laughs> that uh, will just well, sort of evaporate. So, yeah, so the bestiary, the way it works is that um, every example they give are soldier class enemies, and then it tells you how you upgrade from a soldier to one of the higher level enemies. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, every example is a soldier enemy bestiary. Um, oh, interesting that they have different levels then. Yes, it tells it talks about that, too. Because a a level 20 soldier type creature is not necessarily the same thing as a level 10 soldier. Yes. Um, But yes, it tells you how to upgrade them. And I will say the upgrading and monster fuckery creation stuff is quite good. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, I haven't read it in a while. Uh, we were. I was planning on doing another episode about this where we're going to go over the GM stuff and the all that fun nitty gritty. So uh, that'll be a next week Isaiah reading situation. But from what I do remember from when I read it about a year ago, yes, it's very cool. It's very in depth, and it's actually not. Important. It's actually quite easy to use. That's kind of why I like it. No, yeah, exactly. Well, I was going to say it's a. Oh no, the word just intuitive. It's very intuitive. It can yes. be in depth and intuitive. Um. Anyway, long story short, heroic skills cool. Heroic skills very fucking cool. Especially because they actually incentivize you to max out a class, which is a thing that D and D has problems with. Yes. Almost like maybe the level twenty ability should be really cool, D and D, to yeah, make me wanna yeah, they, get them. They should be, and they ain't. Master of combat. Master of combat, baby. <laughs> Master. of combat. Shooting way back up to the top of the book, though. Um, yeah, a little bit. We, we we talk about the combat. Like, are, do you do you think it's worth going over the scenes in greater detail? I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's anything. No, I don't. I mean, no. I mean, a scene is a bespoke moment. It's like a scene in a movie. Like, I've heard some people reading reading certain games. Uh, feel like the idea of a scene is too um, too too ephemeral too wishy-washy uh, and because of that they don't like it because they're like how do I know when a scene ends but I find that to be kind of an odd criticism because you know when a scene ends in a movie right or a show it's the exact same thing so you already know how it works. Just feel like you don't. You know what I mean? No, I yeah, I completely agree. I, I, I when someone's like, "How do I know when a scene ends?" I, I just want to look at them and go, "You'll know." 
Yeah, when two like, characters have sort of stopped talk, like they've sort of effectively run out of things to talk about, or you know the transaction is complete, or the bad guy has finished his speech, the scene is over. When you know? the when 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 the camera fades to black, right? Like that's you know generally, or when it transitions to something else, like that's generally when the thing is over. You know, it's pretty straightforward, even though you want to say it isn't. Or even yeah. though people not say uh, people sometimes feel like it isn't, but but I mean, other than that, no, like, yeah, I love oh, the scene thing system. I, I don't remember where the first time I saw it was, but ever since I've been like, yes, I just want every game to use this end of discussion. Yeah. That being said, if we're not going to talk about conflict, I do want to dovetail the conflict stuff with the way that they handle checks. Um, no, actually, something really interesting, the, the, the way that they handle character death and getting knocked down oh yeah kind of weird that one yeah yeah i oh, i weird. love it I, I think it's super interesting so the way that the game describes hitting zero hp is not like DD where you get knocked unconscious and now you are in a vulnerable state where you can therefore be coup de grade right rules is written unless a player decides actively they cannot be killed when their health reaches zero it's a very active thing that a character that player has to participate in and it, the a GM needs express permission from that player before killing their character. Yeah, you kind of yeah, you can't just like off someone randomly. Uh and what the heck brain you can't just off someone randomly uh be, oh be, because there isn't any so there's no reliable resurrection stuff in the game so like if your character's gone they're gone you can't revivify them or anything so because of that they put a bit of a buffer between your character dying and actually being gone gone yes and the reason why the game states this outside of the the resurrection is that death is supposed to be important it's supposed to be dramatic and it's supposed to be a focal point in a campaign this is heroic fantasy. Your characters are not supposed to be killed by goblins in the forest, right? It's supposed to be <clears throat> spoilers alert. It's supposed to be Aerith's death in Final Fantasy. VII. I was just about to. Ooh, I hate you. You <laughs> took my point, and I was gonna say spoiler alert first too. Ooh, you fuck. Ooh, taking my points, uh, talking over me in my episode. I'm, I'm sorry. Gonna punch you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't think you'd go straight for that. I guess I should have expected I would, it. Though. I mean, look, it's it's either that. Or Titus realizing that he doesn't actually exist and then fading out of his Fading away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a good one, too. Uh, but it should not be is that one time that Titus, uh, the protagonist of Final Fantasy X, was walking on the beach with his girlfriend and then saw what he thought Kicks was a, a soccer ball, ball essentially. Yeah. And then you find out it's a landmine and then he actually fucking dies. <laughs> he Sir. just straight up gets murked in a light novel as a meme. And then his decapitated head falls in his girlfriend's lap and then she screams and then uh, summons him like one of her summons. And as, because he's in a paradox, she can't tell him that he doesn't actually exist or he'll actually stop existing this time for reals. He's actually the supplement material for 10 sucks. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we don't. We ignore it. We, we you play 10, you play 10, too, and then you don't pretend there's nothing else. That's it. <sighs> but he d you know what I do hate? Titus got his dad's cool head wrap. Oh. And like, I don't know, Jack's entire design is just absolute peak. <laughs> Fair enough. Partially because of his uh, cool head wrap. <laughs> there, there, there's also a character in Final Fantasy. I think it's four who like blows himself up by casting like a giga fuck off meteor or whatever. Oh, don't yeah. Oh, what his name is. God, the old I man. know exactly. Right. I know you're talking about. Yeah. yeah well, he, he does that. And then Kane sacrifices himself. I don't remember that bit. But. Yeah, that's the whole thing, you know, because he's like fighting you throughout the game because he's still like kind of sort of evil, kind of. He kinda like sacrifices maybe. himself fighting Golbez. Uh, don't those of you listening, don't worry about it. It's a lot. Spoilers. Spoilers. Yeah, a, a lot of characters Spoilers die in games that are games. 35 years old. Yeah. <laughs> old ass games that you may or may not have played anyway. Yeah, and if you played remake, I, uh, it's frankly, like when <laughs> somebody dies in 14. I'm not actually going to spoil that one. <laughs> oh my god, that one dude. I'm legitimately not going to say. 
that would be so fucking funny. I'm not even going to lie. You know, that one, I'm I'm actually one because of a specific person who is listening. I'm not going to say it, but two, because I don't know. I just shouldn't get that one spoiled. Wait, is it is it a particular? Is it is it the first one? Uh, I don't know who you mean by the first one. <laughs> is it Talos and Jaffe? No. No. I don't remember who. No. No. Are you? Do you? I'm. Did you get it? <laughs> I don't think I did. Damn it! God damn it! Discuss off air, sir. Discuss off air. Did he have the best glow up in Shadowbringers? Yes or no? What? God damn it! <laughs> He's not voiced by the character I'm thinking of. Is it voiced by Talos? I don't know who you're talking about now. And we're going to have to discuss it. Okay. <laughs> I'm very confused. I thought I was being so suave. I, I'm i sorry. Back to the original point. The game assumes that you're knocked unconscious. You are when you are or not. Even, uh, actually, you're not even necessarily unconscious. You are in a what's just called like the surrendered state, which basically just means you've lost the will to fight. It's the got your ass beat. Yeah, it's it's every it's every RPG where your character's like on one like on one leg, on one knee, and he's like grabbing yeah. at his chest and wincing a little bit, and he's doing the same canned sort of shifting animation while the bad guy monologues in front of him. Every time Sora gets his ass kinked in King Hearts. <laughs> <laughs> that specific animation, and they reuse it a lot. Now, that is not to say that you cannot die. You absolutely can. Like once again, with you as the player's permission, you can die. Cools. Yes, it's called the sacrifice. Got a cool and what sacrifice. that basically lets you do is you basically say to the DM, I am no longer going to play this character. And by choosing sacrifice, your character cannot specifically cannot be brought back to life by any means because it would undermine the point. But by saying that you will be giving up this character permanently, but do something you basically sick. get to just yeah, you just get to do some anime tier bullshit. I'm talking like there's a scene in Final Fantasy IX where a character like where they, you know, they summon Bahama, the giant astral dragon, and a character just goes, no, we're not doing that. And despite this dragon laying waste to the capital city, they summon a bigger, angrier uh, spirit, the, the big ass castle Alexander, and it just shoots it with an Omega beam and kills it. Like this, uns like they declare, they they specifically say Bahamut is unstoppable, and one character goes, "No, fuck that dragon," and then nukes it with a castle. That's the anime to your bullshit. Sit with with a castle, and then the castle gets nuked by the moon. <laughs> There's no joke here. There's no that yeah. happens. No, I know you know, but they they don't know. No, that happens. That's a thing. Yeah, Final Fantasy Mine's games. Wild. Final Fantasy games in general get pretty wild at the end. I, when people don't get that, most of nine is like a song, like a Journey to the West reference. I, I don't really know how they don't get it. But they don't. In character's like, a monkey. <laughs> Zidane, yeah, he's literally Wukong. Is his swords combined to to become the staff? Monkey man. The moon? And that would that's very like bees? <laughs> bees? <laughs> the moon? <laughs> <laughs> Warrior of light, where are you going? Moon's haunted. What? Moon's haunted. <laughs> I didn't play Dontra. Or uh, uh fucking Endwalker? Endwalker? Yeah. Moon is haunted though. Moon is haunted. You gotta look, you gotta kick the moon's ass. And the evil spirits on the moon. And maybe God? I, I don't know. I didn't get that far. <laughs> yes, the, the, the sacrifice is a really cool idea. I, I really like that it, it. It, like many of the mechanics in this game. Specifically is looking at the player and saying, you have control over this. This is this is part of the story. You have part of this story in your hands. We're all sharing the narrative together. You know, games like D&D. You can do some anime to your bullshit. I've done it a lot. But at the end of the day, the dungeon master has full control over the narrative. And 
that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying, you know, dungeon masters are like tyrants or whatever, but it is skewed toward the dungeon master. And cool little mechanics like this, like the narrative declarations you can make with the fabula points. It really makes the thing feel like a collaborative storytelling experience. And that's what everyone calls TTRPGs anyway. But like, it really feels like it with this kind of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, after that, we have some pretty basic stuff. Damage typing. Don't think we have to get into that. Uh, they have immunities and resist uh, vulnerabilities, immunity resistances like D&D. They do have a second, uh, uh, a tertiary ability called Absorb, which, I mean, if anyone's played Persona, any of those games. For example, if a creature absorbs fire and you shoot it with a fireball, heal it. Guess what? It's it's going to heal. Yeah. And then you're, you're going to feel real dumb. And then someone who's watching you play the game will laugh at you. And then you'll feel sad. That person's name is Brett because I wasn't paying attention. And I got killed by a Shiki Oji in Okamura's dungeon because I hate those things. It's fine. I'm not upset about it. You're upset about it. Don't worry about it. Violence. So, yeah, we've magical bullshit. You want to talk about that, Josh? Uh, I, I what? Wait, is that? I feel like your notes are jumping Rituals. around a lot. I mean, my notes were very short. I'm, I'm just sort of traveling down the list. Uh, fair enough. I mean, shouldn't we talk about spells for? I mean, it, should, it occurred to me we haven't mentioned the actual die resolution mechanic. Oh, you know what? That's a good point. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, uh, that was definitely big dumb of me. So, kind of uh, jumped over that in, one. Yeah, we did. Look, uh, I was, I'm just, I was just kind of going by the seat of my pants on this one. I, I, this, this has been a busy couple weeks. Also, I'm going oh, to a wedding this week. Going in, I don't know why you're not just going in book order. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, well, check. Please think this out. Well, yes. So, much this like is, every other game. This is one of the places where I also find I, I saw it was eh, a little bit of an odd decision. Well, do you want to take control of this one then? Uh, I mean, so the, the, the baseline of the mechanic is pretty simple and straightforward. Y you have four stats. You have dex, insight, might, and willpower. Um, you pick your stat. There's three different stat arrays you choose from when you do character creation. It's not it's not um, bound to a class or anything. Uh, and it's done by die size as opposed to a static number. So it's either a D6, a D8, a D10, or in some rare circumstances, you can go up to a D12. Um, and basically, when you do a check, you roll two dice. Uh, and those two dice are determined by, you know, what makes sense for the check, essentially what the GM tells you. So... The example in insight and willpower check performed by a character with six insight and 10 willpower uh, would roll a D6 and a D10 and then add the result together. Um, you can also roll two of the same stat, so you could do a might might check. So if your might stat was a D8, you would just roll two D8. Um, the, the double stat checks are a little bit rarer and I think the game says somewhere to use those a little bit less because they are mechanically a little stronger um, uh, yeah, hilariously almost all spell casting using foci use that exact does like, use uh, double those yes because yeah, uh, I, I think that's on purpose though yeah well yeah because it's you like, know the, the fumble on magic is more yeah. of a problem than missing on an attack um, there aren't static modifiers by default there will be circumstantial bonuses where the gm might add a plus two or a minus two um but your your character doesn't when you roll you don't add any static modifiers with the exception of some weapons will give you a static modifier so like swords for example i think are are like might uh might plus dex and then it'll say plus one so in that case you have a static modifier um, but yeah, basically the D you have a DC number, you roll the two dice, you beat the DC number, pretty straightforward. Uh, and then also what I guess worth mentioning, um, when you're attacking with something, your damage is determined by what's called the high roll or the HR as it gets abbreviated. So if you roll a D eight and a D 10, and then the roll on the D eight shows a six and the roll on the D 10 shows a nine, then the high roll for that would be a nine. 
And so if you have a weapon that does high roll plus five damage, you would do nine plus five. You did 14 damage. So essentially the attack roll and the damage roll are lumped together into one roll, which I like that helps speed things up, makes life easy. Yes, I, I very much appreciate that. Um, and difficulty level is the same as your usual DC. The the thing about this, so the thing that's... Well, actually, real quick, do you want to... Uh, difficulty... Uh, yeah, difficulty level is something I wanted to bring up about this. The number does change, but they are concrete in their... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The difficulty modifiers will increase based on how difficult the check is, but you as the dungeon master do not actually have control over those. They are at set intervals. And I'm no. trying to find... Yeah, they are. No, you can you can change what... You can you decide the DC. 7 is but easy, no, you, 10 is normal, 13 is hard, 16 is very hard. That's what I'm saying. But you So you can't make a very hard check that's DC 18. I'm pretty sure you can. I don't think it says you well, have... I think those are just the suggested numbers. I don't think you have to use those. I It said you choose them from the list given below. Not that you can, or you like you can't. It just says you choose them from this. Difficulty is in my head. Abstraction, true quest, blah blah blah. Turn indicated below table. Accomplish this. I mean, I don't remember reading that you had to use those numbers. All they want to accomplish. The game master declares the difficulty level for the check using the table on the next page as a reference. Sometimes the difficulty will be indicated by a specific rule. The game master must also inform the player about the consequences of failure, making sure everyone is, understands. I don't think you have to use those numbers. Okay, fair enough then. I, I guess I must have misread that. I thought they were saying that you had to choose those numbers, which is interesting because it gives you... I was going to relate this back to Lancer. It gives yeah, you more no. than it does with Lancer, for sure. I, I'm still struggling with that in the other system. Yeah, I, I think the intention is these are general guidelines. We don't necessarily have to do those numbers exactly. But also, given those four different numbers, probably won't need to use much outside of that variation anyway. TBH. Yeah, I mean, you also, I'm going to be honest, you really can't go that high. You know, you at most have no. a D12 plus a D10. Best you're doing, yeah, I mean, maybe there's some circumstance where you could roll two D12s. I, I don't know of any genuinely I where you can roll. I the highest it seems like any, you can get, and if you then that, just assuming you roll perfectly, is I think twenty four, right? Which would be two d twelves. Well, I'm, I'm thinking one d twelve plus one d ten plus two. Oh, if you have a modifier, yeah, I guess. If you have a modifier, yeah, the highest it seems like you can go is twenty four total. So Point I can imagine if, you, if a DC of like twenty is is. Damn near ludicrously high. Yeah. Um, the thing that I find a little strange on the check system, um, I know what they're doing. So the author very specifically mentions Ryutama at the beginning of the book, which is another, which is a, which is a Japanese made game. That's very intentionally made to invoke a kind of studio Ghibli esque adventure feel. Um, and in Ryutama, it's a similar situation where you don't have static modifiers. You have an increasing die size. And what an increasing die size does is it means that your character doesn't necessarily get more reliably good at the thing they're doing, but they have a higher ceiling. So in a kind of fictional sense, because in Ryutama, you're not really playing her heroes. You're playing... Jahira in Spirited Away. You're playing like Princess Mononoke in Princess Mononoke. You maybe you're playing Hal in Hal's Moving Castle, but you're not like D and D esque heroes, right? You have some proficiency you could get into a fight, but you're nothing crazy. So in that game, the idea of you don't get particularly good or more reliable at a fight or a skill or whatever but you get a slightly higher ceiling because you have a little bit of practice, like fictionally makes sense. In this game though, you are explicitly heroes fighting like the dark forces. 
So it's a little weird that they don't use modifiers because it means that your character doesn't necessarily get more reliable at the thing they're doing because they're not getting a static number. Now there is a, they get a little bit more reliable because you're using two dice. So increasing one of your two dice, you know, and going from it from a D six and a D eight to like two D eights, you're getting like a better average. So it is a little bit reliably better, but you could still roll like two ones. You know, you could still roll a one and a two, you know, you're not, you're, you're not getting a flat modifier that guarantees you a baseline. Correct. So and just I think that's to totally bring back to an earlier point. Totally a little weird. Yeah. Yes. Which again, to bring it back to an earlier point, that's why I feel like the fabula points almost aren't optional. I think the game understands that you're going to fail checks with a relative consistency. But fabula points and to don't counterbalance necessarily. That, I mean, they give you rerolls, I guess. Well, they give you so they give you as many rerolls as you want, assuming you yeah. have the points to burn them. And you get to choose to keep certain numbers. So if you have a D12 and a D6 and you roll that 12, you can choose to keep that 12 and just re-roll the six. Right. For, uh, for I guess for context, you should probably mention, I don't know if we said this or not, but Fabula points, what they let you do is you can spend one point to alter the story, invoke a bond or invoke a trait. Uh, invoking a trait lets you reroll dice. Invoking a bond adds the strength of the bond to the check as a flat modifier. And then alter the story is sort of you get a little bit of the GM side of things and you get to throw in, you get to alter the fiction of the game in some fashion. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, the invoking the trait one, I get, well, I guess actually invoking the bond one it gives you static number. So, yeah. Uh, they do make up for it, but it does still feel, I don't know. It's just a little bit of an odd choice. I think to not go with a static modifier of some kind, or to say something like your dice can't roll below a certain number or something like that. I don't know. It's not the worst. It's not like, un it's not like your characters are going to be bumblefuck idiots, but it's not like the averages, the number averages are not that bad, but yeah, I thought that was an interesting choice. I also think the critical success system a little interesting because yes, yes, to roll a critical success, you have to roll two numbers. So you have to roll doubles on your dice. So a six and a six, a seven and a seven, an eight and an eight. But you can't roll below a six. So if you get two fours, that's not a critical success. You rolled an eight. You probably, you know, you may or may not have failed. You, it has to be a six or higher. You have to be double six, double seven, double eight, double nine, double ten, double eleven, or double twelve. Um, I don't know what the idea was there. I guess the idea was if you rolled really shitty but rolled like double twos, it's like, no, you still rolled poorly. Sorry, bud. I guess is the idea yeah. on that one. Yes. Um, I I thought you were going to bring up the opportunities, which is something I also. Oh, I mean up. the opportunities. I like those are cool. That opportunities are yeah. So opportunities are effectively status conditions you oppose on the situation based on the fact that you critically succeeded. Uh, so like you could get advantage. So the next check performed by you or an ally will receive a plus four. You can inflict a status. You can create a bond, uh, choose a creature present. They make a compromising state statement chosen by the person who controls them. Uh, your action earns someone else's support. So it's yeah, you have like a fictional status effect. Oh, scan. I didn't see that one. That's kind of fun. Discover a vulnerability or trait of a creature you can see. Oh, that's cool. Um, so yeah, the opportunities I like, those are cool. It's also interesting. Critical success doesn't give you better damage. It does not. No, I feel like it should. I don't know. I'm always of the opinion that it just give me more. Give me, give me, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, opportunities you could still use to give yourself, you know, better shit in a fight, but yeah, it's not straight better damage. Yeah, I'm trying yeah. to think if, if you could I'm just and looking then, to see if there's anything you could do to argue better damage, but no, yeah. I don't Unless you think say so. like, you know, lost item, an item is destroyed, lost or stolen or left behind, you can use that to like break an, an enemy boss's armor or something so they take more damage from now on, but I mean that you could do. Um and then a fumble is just 
a double one. Um, and a fumble doesn't have a strong penalty. Fumbles are actually kind of good because you get a fabula point. You do. You get one full fabula point out of them. Oh. Uh, worth noting, <clears throat> you cannot re-roll or use fabula points on any fumbled roll. You just yes, kind of have, have to take, to take that your out. L. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sit down. Accept your defeat. Don't be a bitch. Yeah. What was the 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 the, the this is my dub and you must hand it to me. It's the opposite. Yeah. 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 This is the L and you must accept it. Sorry, yeah. Chief. So there is that. Uh, now that we've sort of discussed the that's checks the, and how they the play primary, out, Yes, that is the primary resolution mechanic. Yes. Uh, we can move on to magic and spells. Spells and magic and... Magic is separated into two separate main categories. You have spells, which are what you'd expect from things like D&D. You know, you, that's your fireball, your fly, uh, shield, stuff like that. And then you have your rituals, which are very interesting. Uh, yes, spells, not super exciting. They do kind of what you expect. Um, this game doesn't have spell slots. It has mind points, which are basically mana points. If you played any other game, um, spells cost a certain amount of mana, you know, mind points. You have no mind points. You can't cast them, you know, mm -hmm. the usual. Um, now, the cool thing I was going to say, the cool thing about rituals is that <laughs> all of it. Yeah, I mean, all of it, they rituals are sort of created to be a abstract approach to the magic. If there is a spell in the game that does not fit a specific niche, if there is a situation in the game that does not have a specific spell, you can create a ritual to fill that void as a like a one time only, which is to say you can't replicate it with any consistency unless it's super easy. But then at that point, it's probably just a spell as this one time only incredibly powerful thing that you can do using magic checks. You just sort of, as me and Josh like to pull it, weave magical bullshit to solve your problem. Yeah, it's kind of similar to the, uh, it's kind of similar to how Blades does like projects where you say, I would like to do X, Y, and Z effect. And the GM says, it will cost you this many mind points. It will be this hard. And then, you know, you as the player might say, I would like it to affect one person or a couple of people or a huge a forest or a fortress worth of people. The larger area you affect, the uh, the harder it is to do. It's a modifier. And then the crazier so like an extreme ritual, it says weaken a divine entity, prevent a catastrophe, cause a week long change in a creature that would cost you 50 mind points and uh, difficulty level 16 and then if you wanted to do that to an entire forest that would be whatever 50 times 4 is in mind point was it 200 which I don't even know if you could do that until you're like max level uh, you can if you partake in a group ritual is that, oh, yeah, that right. it divvies that up too. the wine points along anybody who's doing the ritual uh, but, but you yeah, need a lot like, of people at that point yeah the idea of the weave magical bullshit is that you want to do a magical effect not covered under any sort of um, not covered by the spell list. You negotiate with your GM, do the rolls and then cause the effect. And the cool thing and it does specify a couple of things. So like a ritual you can't use to do damage. So you can't do like a fireball ritual because that's what spells are for. Um you can't inflict or remove status effects. You can't generally like hurt or cause someone to lose mind points or something like that. Um, try to avoid replicating the effect of a spell or a skill that already exists. Uh, and you can't just like generate f equipment out of thin air. <laughs> so you can't just be like, I would like to ritual up an Excalibur, please. No, you cannot. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's it's that fictional thing. It's 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 a thing that I always want because I just, I, you know, fictionally, it feels like the wizard character should be able to have an idea and then come up, you know, in the same way that the like engineer character should be able to MacGyver up a solution to a problem like the wizard should be able to be like, ah, I can weave a spell to do something here, you know, and it's sort of what rituals in D&D are trying to do, right? Like, that's kind of what rituals are in D&D. They're non-combat magical effects to, like, solve a problem, like, detect magic. But, you know, it's a bespoke list in D&D, so you have to obey the list. Whereas this has way more narrative weight to it. 
I'm trying to think of like a good like fictional example that would be like what a ritual would feel like in this game, but I'm I'm kind of blanking right now. Yeah, I'm I'm also well actually uh Oh god, what uh crap. Oh no. Uh Yeah. Yeah, I'm blanking real hard too. I'm trying to think of like a fantasy like show or something. <laughs> it's like a good all I can think of though is Avatar, which is like not helping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh Jam- hmm. damn it. Oh well, I just thought of one, but it uh kind of a spoiler for Arcane, so I guess I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> oh yeah, it. yeah. Oh I, we might be thinking of the same might thing. Might be thinking actually. of the same scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a thing uh, a thing a thing that Victor did, perhaps? Yeah. Oh, actually, okay, I have a perfect one, right? Uh-huh. In Final Fantasy VII, uh, the character Aerith, who, spoilers, dies, dies. is uh, <laughs> something called an ancient. And Spoiler halfway alert. through the game, yeah, uh, she conducts this, like, massive rite uh. to commune with the planet itself to help them defeat Sephiroth. Oh, yeah, there you go, yeah. And, like, the, the, the ritual is not kill Sephiroth, it's not destroy his sword or take away his power, it's you know, give us the strength and the knowledge necessary to defeat our foe. Yes. Granted, she uh, dies before she gets the chance to do that. Spoilers. And then Cloud just goes, well, fuck it. I'm just going to summon King Arthur to kick your ass. And that's the whole thing. It's the only way to beat him in the main game. But also, he's um, sad. also Cloud. He's also sad and maybe a little steamed, a little steamed broccoli because he fell into the life juice. The super life juice. Just the, the juice, he just, he, what is it? Uh, oh no. <laughs> oh god. There, oh. there was the meme where it was like, why did you fill my room with slime? And the person's like, it's slime time. <laughs> it's, <that>. <laughs> it's slime time. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a decent, that's a decent ritual example. The, the takeaway is that it gives you a lot of really fun fictional freedom to be like, I am this kind of magical person and you can flavor it via whatever your class, you know, your class combination is. So, for example, if you're a, a Dark Knight elementalist, your ritual is going to look very different than if you're like an Arcanist Wayfarer, you know. Um, So that's it, it's just just everything i want and on top of that there's also a projects mechanic to build shit in a similar way to how the ritual works if you're playing a tinkerer so yes you have that correct. too so you can if macgyver up some bullshit yeah if you just want to just want to actually the, you know it's funny the project things are a lot easier to visualize if anyone's watched uh guardians of the galaxy just anytime rocket just starts grabbing some yeah. random ass odds and ends to make a bomb or something yes perfect example uh, or I don't know if if you were Saturday morning cartoon kid, at, at the joke at the end of like the uh, Ben Ten Alien Force season one, where it's like, well, whenever you find some alien gear, and Ben goes, "You work on the car," and Kevin goes, "I work on the car." <laughs> <laughs> I love that line so much. <laughs> <laughs> ben, women are like cars. Yeah. Uh huh. Go ahead. No. No. I said so I made a mistake. <laughs> 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 such a good bit. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, nothing beats how resolute that no is. Just, yeah. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I will. <laughs> I'm not going to. <laughs> uh, uh, and then it does also mention if you're using rituals in a conflict scene, uh, basically you just set it up as a clock countdown project and go from the. Can we explain the clocks situation? No. No, we haven't, but we've talked about clocks a It's clocks times. from Blades of the Dark. They just took clocks from Blades of the Dark and they stuck them in this game. It works great. Yeah, what I mean, uh, you, uh, clocks lightning round. You create something called a clock. It's sort of a visual re- uh, representation of steps you need to take to complete a goal. It's a countdown Typically by clock. succeeding on checks. Yes. Uh, typically by succeeding on checks, you fill pips in the clock. Once the clock is complete, the thing is done. It takes a couple rounds or a couple, you know, steps, rounds, sessions, whatever rounds you long or need successful to take. checks or something along those lines. Yeah. It's 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 a pretty intuitive mechanic, uh, and it a lot of games it. do it nowadays. I, I just didn't and this game actually enough. recommends you use it quite a bit for quite a lot of things, including combat, and sometimes including combat. Yes, yeah, depending on how you how important the combat is. 
Uh, uh, I think the last two things I want to bring up equipment. is uh, honestly no, because equipment is so simple. I mean, you could. Uh, we, I mean, we can do it fast. Yes. Very so the game, yeah, the game assumes that in a lot of cases, because this is a narrative-driven game first, that equipment like adventuring gear is stuff that your characters always have. And if they don't have it reasonably, depending on your identity, you can just sort of say that you have it. So the way they, they talk about it, like you if you are, a, didn't it say you could like spend a fabula point, to like whip out something you might not have. If it's not relevant to your characters, so they, they talk about yeah. like Lily, the thief, because her background is burglar. It doesn't she doesn't need to say that she has lock picks on her. She just has them. She doesn't even have to spend points on it. You just assume that a burglar would have lock picks. But yes. like Darius the Crusader would have to burn a couple Fabula points to produce lockpicks. Was it? Was it Fabula? It, it was Fabula points. Yes. Yeah. Uh, typically two to four is what they talk about. Um, I don't. I think they say you shouldn't go over four. That's a lot of Fabula points. It's a lot. Yeah. It, um, it's also interesting because this game gives you an inventory points. Yes. That Actually, spend. that's a good point. I forgot about that. That's an interesting thing. Yes, so the way that works is you have your adventuring pack. And in your adventuring pack, there is a certain like list of items that the game gives you that your character basically will always have. They just assume that you have it. And that is an elixir, a remedy, a tonic. So that's curing 50 mind points for elixir, healing uh, 50 points, uh, hit points for remedy, and a tonic can recover a single status effect. And then for utility, you have elemental shards, which deal uh, assorted elemental damage, depending on what type they are, and a magic tent, which is just your sleeping gear tent. Uh, the game just says you have these at all times. And to produce them from your pack, you have to spend a number of inventory points, which I believe as standard is six for everybody. Uh, it does not go higher than that. Naturally, I think it can. Oh, no, uh, sorry. It wasn't stuff? fabula points. It was inventory points to whip out something that you might not. Oh, watch OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inventory. That makes more sense. Uh, so, for example, you know, if you are in the middle of combat and someone just got walloped by the grenade, the, the creature, not the weapon, uh, you can run up to that person and just produce a, heal, a health potion and give them a good old slap on the ass. And then they are healed. It just be that way. Yeah, it's essentially instead of you don't track any kind of specific gear you just use spend the points have the thing and if it reasonably makes sense for you to have the thing go for it it's very loosey-goosey um which i'm actually fine with because quite frankly i don't really give a fuck about tracking how many potions you know my my dark knight has i'm here to fucking fight dragons and save the princess or whatever so i think for this style of game i'm not saying i would want this in every kind of game but i think for this style of game just spend point produce thing makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And it's it's I mean, I don't know a better word to put it than elegant. Yeah, Just I mean, an elegant yeah. system. The game also doesn't give a shit about like tracking ammo or worrying about like arcane focuses and like what hand is free or any of that bullshit that D&D work cares about. Like it's like if you could freely move your arms and say words verbally, you could cast a spell. If you want to shoot the spell out your sword or out your penis, nobody cares. Um, oh, I mean, it is funny. They do specify you cannot stealthily cast spells. Yeah, no stealth casting, which yeah. is, is really funny. They're just like, nope, even if you can whisper the words, some magical bullshit will happen and yes, somebody yes. will catch you. You just can't. I do mean, it. I'm sure I'm sure you could maybe negotiate a role or something. But yeah, actually, this, this isn't necessarily a specific rule thing that I wanted to bring up, but I did want to bring this up. This game is very firm on things on both sides of the spectrum. It specifically tells players what they can and cannot do. And then outside of that, they say, go buck wild. But they also say that to the DM in a lot of ways, right? Like you cannot, uh, uh, you know, you cannot not award players fabula points when the villain shows up. You cannot yeah. kill a player without their permission. It, I, I like that it, the game itself acts as a mediator in a lot of ways. It does, yeah. It's very good. Um, other than the inventory points, there's just your basic equipment. There's a couple of if you, you need to have the ability from a class to use martial weapons and martial armor. Um, equipment does standard stuff. 
gives you like a defense score for armor, gives you what stats you roll for like regular attacks. There are there are magic items. They call them rare items. Those will usually have like a one special quality that, um, you know, gives you some kind of benefit. Yes, also, and they are. There's fun. also artifact items, but those are intended to be. They're not like a cool sword you get. Artifact items are like. Uh, what sort I'm looking for, like campaign narrative defining, like this super specially awesome thing. That's, you know, what the entire game is centered around. It's not just like a yeah, piece of they're, gear. They're like the vestiges of divergence. They are world altering yes. items. The hand of Vecna type nonsense. Yeah. The infinity gauntlet, that kind of shit. Um, Actually, yeah, I think what, what, sorry. One of the, one of the really funny artifacts is just the dead man. Zenny. It's just, yeah, it's just a coin. It's just indestructible and it might have a soul in it. Maybe it's, it's very specifically said it's easily lost or misplaced. So it's just this thing that exists in the lore or in the universe that everyone knows about and no one really knows if it is or isn't the coin in question. Yeah. I kind of like that because it does nothing, but it is like that in theory could be a, a campaign altering item if it's if you make it like the the Aztec coins from Pirates of the Caribbean or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the weapons and armor, like, there's really nothing to say. Pretty basic, you know, they don't have like weapon properties like D&D yeah. &D does now. They don't do anything like particularly special. They are some cool, yeah, like the rare items. Uh, in some of the later books, you have some pretty really cool stuff that you can do, like trick weapons. Pretty really cool. What the fuck is wrong with me? There's some really cool stuff you can do with like trick weapons, like Bloodborne, where they transform and have specialty yeah. effects. But I'm going to be honest, we're not going to do 15 episodes on Fabulous Ultimate. We could, but we're not going to. <laughs> we could. Uh, I will say I was a little miffed at the fact that they have a pistol, but no two handed gun option. Thought that was very strange. I, yeah, that was kind of funny. They, they're just that like bugged me. gun. Well, so they have it in rare items. You in have rare, like, but not a normal two handed. Yeah, item. like I can't have a musket rifle of some kind. Yeah, that that is a little strange. I, I did really like they have a weapon called Quartermain. Uh, in reference to Alan Quartermain, like a, he's a literature character, he's like a you know super cool spy gunman. There's a movie about the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. He has a double barrel rifle named Matilda. Sure. I don't know. I, it was a cool reference for a character that most people don't know about anymore. Yeah, I mean, I have no idea who you're talking about. So yeah, read. He's plays. He's voice. He's played by Sean Connery. It's the it's the role that made him quit acting because the movie was such a nightmare to make. Okay. I love that movie. It's terrible. <laughs> it's, sure. It's like dreadfully bad, but it's, I love it so much. Alrighty then. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh, just looking at the book. There's the journeys section. Um. Nothing super specially awesome there. No, but Standard. I do want to bring up the villains. Okay. Because the villains are super sick. I figured the villains would be a Nick kind of on the GM side. Ah, uh, it is. Uh, yeah, we are at two hours. Okay. We're going to start next episode talking about the villains because they're sick as fuck. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Don't let me forget that. Internet. For those who are curious about how experience and levels up, leveling up works, because I always care about this because I think it's really important. Um... You automatically and gain five XP. I hate that. Um, you gain an amount of XP equal to the amount of Ultima points that are spent by the villains. Those are essentially the fabula points for the bad guys. So every time your GM spends points to beat you into the dirt, at least you're getting XP for it. Um, and then you get XP for the amount of fabula points you spend as a group divided by the number of characters. So you spent you know, 12 points and there's four characters. Each of you gets three XP. Uh, those two ones I like a lot. I don't like the free five XP. That annoys me. Um, and then every 10 XP, every 10 points of XP, you buy a level for your character. You, as we said, you get a class. You level one of your classes and get one of those abilities. 
Um, every time you level up, you can, you know, adjust your hit points and your mind points. Um, when you reach level 20 or 40, uh, choose one of your attributes and increase it to a D12. Uh, and then, uh, you know, increase one of your classes. That's pretty essential. Right? Also, your XP isn't cumulative. You spend it. So if you have 12 XP and then you spend two, you go down to two XP. Um, and then there's a couple of optional rules for earning XP, which is kind of fun, which is, uh, you can, wait, 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 where are they? There we go. There's the blitz one, which is the amount you gain XP, gain additional XP at the end of each battle in which all the enemies fled or reduced to zero hit points. The amount gained by each character will be five minus the number of rounds that elapsed in the turn. So if you take them all out in one turn, you get five extra XP. Kind of like that one. Then there's the booster one, which is you just get a level at the end of every session. Don't like that. Um, and then I do like the embodiment, which is uh, anytime you embody your character's identity or theme, uh, you gain additional two XP. If two or more players are tied, they will each gain this bonus XP. Uh, oh, because it's only one. Yeah, you choose one character. Uh, and then there's the MVP one, which I'm if on. Uh, basically, the group just kind of votes on who will be the MVP and they get two additional XP. Two people can win it if they're tied. Uh, eh, eh, eh. I don't know if I'd use the MVP one, but I like the embodiment and I like the blitz one. Those are fun. I don't like the booster one. So there's a couple of there's a couple of different facets of how you can handle XP. Um. I, I don't know. I don't know if I have a favorite one. I, I read those and I like, hmm. I'm mostly OK with how the XP is done in this game. Like I said, I always hate free XP in any game. So I immediately was like, nope, don't do that. Um, but the other ones I'm fine with. I think the spending the points for XP makes a lot of sense. That's very good to incentivize that. You know, I was trying to think, you know, because we did the, the Star Wars fulfill objectives thing, like personal objectives. Yes. I don't know how that would work in this game. I was because well, I was thinking about it. I mean, that's effectively what the uh, the theme getting XP for your theme or your identity. That's kind of what that is. Um, yeah, I, I, I see that more as the roleplay XP we used. Uh, in in blades. In a D&D. Well, that too, yeah, but it didn't it come from blades? Well, sort of. Kind of I mean, Blades has that built in. I added it to D. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, the embodiment really for me is more of like the the ones that we did in D and D. Whereas in Star Wars, it was the like, I spoke to Luke Skywalker. I get XP. You know. Um. Yes. I but I, that one. But the idea is that is still kind of the same in that you're going after a character goal or you're or you're doing something relevant to a character to your character backstory. Like you're doing something that's about your character's like f uh, place in the world. Right. The, di the difference being like completing a mission versus embodying like a thematic element of your character. You kind of a similar kind of a similar sort of gameplay effect. Those two. So I think you could do the goal one fine in Fabula. See why you couldn't. I almost wonder what was the point of putting experience in any way. I think I, I think it makes perfect sense just to say your characters level up every other session. Um, well, personally, because I don't like that, but, you know, sure, you could. I mean, just they, they set like a not necessarily a hard limit, but like a recommended limit maximum of 50 sessions. So I think the point you, of having XP is because people like XP and there's there's XP is a dial that you can adjust as a GM to do to invoke different vibes, if you will. For example, using XP as a carrot to incentivize spending Fabula points. That's one reason you could do that's it. That's true. But also, that's true. I'll give you that. Also, having the XP there to incentivize playing into a character's theme, uh, theme or identity, is a way that you can incentivize your characters to role play, your players to role play a little bit more into their, you know, what their character is. So it's a good, it's a good carrot, a lot of the time. 
And that's, you know, like I said, I thought about that like that. So, yeah, that's fair. And this game doesn't seem super worried about characters being like slightly different levels from each other. It doesn't seem like that's going to be a huge problem. So why not just let people level as they as they do? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I, I just, you know, I, I had some issues in my campaign where, where characters were not proccing their personal XP as much as they want, be it because, you know, either they're more quiet players or they had bad days or whatever. And, like, it did get to a point where one character was, like, a full-ass two levels behind. You're like, uh, crap. Well, yes, but and I think in D&D that's uh, uh, going to be a bigger effect than in this game. Which, you know, that matters. Yeah, I mean, it could be for sure. Because, you know, a level here or there is just essentially bumping a skill here or there, right? It's only like the 10, the 10 step levels are like the bigger, the bigger chunks in this game. Hmm. Mm. Oh, as, as a minor thing before we end it, I I, mm-hmm. I do think I, I'm not a huge fan of you having to level into using rituals for each of the casters. Uh, well, you have to just no, you, you get rituals as a free thing. No, you don't. So like with each of the casters, you get ritual, uh, ritual spiritism. You may perform rituals whose effect falls in the spiritism discipline. Uh, yes, but you also get the basic rituals. You may perform rituals that fall within the ritualism discipline. Oh, yes, you do get the... Yes. Everyone gets the basic one, and then you can spec yeah. into the more specific one. Yeah, I, I think, personally, just by nature of being that class, you should be able to do that. But, might not care, yeah. though. You might not, but... Uh, if, also only uh, a singular level, so... I know it's only a singular level, but a lot of the classes have like uh, just going to Guardian has a total of uh, like a max technically of six, seven, 13, like, uh, like, uh, you know, you can, yeah, you can only reach level 10, but there's technically 13 available levels for Guardian because you can take Divine Mastery and Fortress five times each. Yeah. I don't know. Doesn't Just free up some space. I'm saying. Doesn't bother me that much. It doesn't bother me that much. It just it's like a little frustrating. Get over it, forehead. I guess. On, on a side <laughs> note, I, the entropist. I think you know the huh. black mage. But the the entropist slash black mage. I kind of dripped out way better than the fourteen like standard drip for black mage. With the stupid eye patch hat. I don't know if I agree with that, but all right, that's a, that's, a, that's a choice. I also I would argue the elementalist. I would argue the elementalist is the black mage. Black mage's whole thing is is fire and ice primarily. It, it yes, I mean, black mage is is I believe it's elementalist and entropist because entropist's whole thing is about the oomph. Like they are right. element mages, but they are about about biggest numbers. I don't think they suggest a oh they suggest a sage. They don't suggest they don't have a black mage. Oh weird they don't. Yeah. They're no, sage yeah, and they absolutely. have red sorcerer. Black mage would absolutely be elemental uh, elementalist and anthropist. I don't think you can have one without the other. Uh I don't know, I'd have to I'd have to look at it. Black mage's final thing is the meteor. Only entropists can cast meteor. I guess. Entropies also have the weird like stolen time effects and stuff though which is kind of they do have that also actually in 14 yeah. that's flare it's still meteor <laughs> it's not but I mean it it's represented as a fucking meteor like flare not. is supposed to be like a death beam Wait, the they, LV1 for all casters is a meteor that's not that's not yeah for all casters. That's not Black Mage's flares. Flare is an ability they have. Big like flare explode. It's like a sun explode. 
Also, it's not. Motherfucker, let's end this episode. <laughs> it's two hours and 20 minutes. It's also not the L... Never mind. It's not the LB1, but that's beside the point. Yeah, Abby. God, I don't know what to tell you, Chief. <laughs> Fine, it's not. But also, you got right. Don't look at me to wrap it up. You got to fucking... All right, well, do you have any final thoughts? Potatoes? I don't know. We jumped over, jumped around too goddamn much. I don't know why you did just go in book order. You threw me off. Um, I mean, I, I, I did up until the character creator, and then it... You just did, sort of and then apart. you just spiraled out of control. Well, because I feel like you, you, like, I don't know. I like, It made me hype. I don't know. The hype was real. This game is hype. You could have waited, you could have waited to that bit, though. Uh, Dang you know, I blew my load a little early. I, you you, know, did, you did absolutely all, did. I don't know. Yeah, I game cool. I don't know. I, I said most of my tidbits. Like I said, I have complaints, but most of them are quite specific, like minute. Mm. Yeah. Yes, game cool. Game cool, much like monster. I, I think that's it. I think that's all we got until next time. Um, Follow us on Twitter. We're probably going to make a blue sky soon because don't commit really to anything. Fun. I'm not promising anything. I, I will probably make a blue sky for our account soon. Let's see about that. Uh, I didn't say now, eventually, because Twitter's exploding. Don't promise things you can't promise. Never say anything on the Internet. You're not going to follow through it. That's the rule. I, I, look, I didn't look. I didn't pull a specific person. I didn't say a quote me on that. I said probably. I know, but you still should just just don't just don't ever commit to anything on the Internet. That's like a number one rule, I guess. Maybe not number one, but it's up there. Follow us on on an app. Follow us on social media. In application. <laughs> that's, uh, that's all I got. Uh, Peace, uh -huh. motherfuckers. <laughs>